This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody, especially the kids from Mary Kay, Good College Park and Trentwood Schools. You join us, not for the first time here, for a safari in the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park. My name is James Henry. I am filmed by Viam Duren Brack magnificent fellow that he is and we start today's show quite sadly really what we have over there is a dead impala now you can ask us any questions you like you can just ask a teacher she'll send them through to us and we will do our level best of course to answer anything that you would like to ask also a very warm welcome to our regular viewers who will be taking over the questions after 45 minutes now, I know this is a sad thing to see everybody, but what we think has happened here is not that it was killed by a leopard or a lion or a hyena, which of course are the major predators out here, because if you look carefully, you can't see any wound there. We think that it was possibly killed by another impala. Now, this is the time of the year when the impala are rutting. They fight with each other and sometimes their fights can result in one of them dying either he's cracked his skull or we'll turn him over and just have a look and see if he hasn't been pierced by another impala now what i don't want to do is do that while you're watching just in case it gets very disgusting so i'm going to do that when we hand you over to someone else and before we do that i must just tell you that we have to scan very carefully around here because the chances are that there's a leopard here maybe and maybe the leopard's just too shy to come and eat or maybe it's so tired from killing the impala that it's hiding under a bush somewhere and so what we don't want to do is frighten the leopard away or get ourselves in danger by climbing out next to a leopard's dinner so we won't do that very good news is that Ralph has got one of these chaps but alive Well, thanks, James, and welcome aboard, everybody, for another sunset safari. We are here in the Juma concession of the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa, and you're watching Safari Live with me, Ralph Kirsten, and on the camera, we got Craig. How's it, Craig? Now, please don't forget to send us your questions through your teachers and welcome aboard to all the kids in the different schools. We've got a lovely, cool, uh, it's, it's, it's a very um, comfortable afternoon. So it's not hot, it's not cold, and well, at least we've got a, a nice big group of impala here just near to us. I know James was showing you one that has unfortunately died. But here we have a group of females just feeding through the thickets and there is one big male with them. He's obviously taken this on as his breeding herd. There's one with the little horns. That's a little male. But not to be confused uh, with the females because the females don't have any horns. Now, Caden, the impala will fight with each other, mostly the males, if not all the time the males, because they want to uh, try to see who's the boss and who's going to be in charge of the big groups of females. So the males will stay in their groups together, but then they fight it out. It's almost like a football team uh, trying to beat another football team so that they can get the cheerleaders uh, and be um, very interested or get the cheerleaders interested in them so that's what these males are doing they're fighting over the cheerleaders and there's a little young male who's not going to be fighting with anybody just yet because he's too young for now all he's worried about is just staying with the with the uh, with the ladies with mommies and uh, getting enough food so that he can get nice and strong and one day he'll also be able to fight with the other males for an, uh, for some of the females so it's nice to just sit here a little bit and wonderful that James is out with the vehicle. He is looking for animals on his side and I'm going to be looking for animals on my side. A little bit uh, different area to where James is in. We're both on vehicles and we do have 
um, uh, Steve, who's going to be out on foot as well. Now, let me just move forward a little bit just to see if we can get a better view of these Impala. Don't forget to send your questions through, though. I want to know what you guys want to know about these Impala. Raiden, I think there could be in the region of about and uh, let's see because it was quite difficult for me to see when we first got here because they were all in the bushes but now i can see there's a lot of impala here they're all over the place i would say there's about 40 or 50 of them but maybe i'm maybe i'm being a little bit too much maybe maybe 30 to 40. So this is wonderful, everybody. These are the animals that obviously leopard would be uh, pred predating on or looking to eat, to catch. But for the moment, they all look very safe because they're uh, watching. There's lots of eyes and ears. And, uh, well, it's time for us to head you on over to the bushwalk team and see how their eyes and ears are going on the ground. Well, we're a bit elevated at the moment to see if we can see anything in the distance. Welcome. My name is Steve Falconbridge. I'm joined on camera by Sebastian. This morning, boys and girls, we had a male lion down there sitting on a termite mound like this. So our job this afternoon, we're going to go see if we can find him on foot. Might sound quite scary, and it is quite scary, but if you understand them and you respect them... Okay, so we've got our backpack. We've got suitable shoes on, we've got lots and lots of water, binoculars, enthusiasm. We're excited, we're out on foot in the African wilderness. It's always marvelous to be out here. Matthew, you want to know why we need safaris? Well, I suppose people don't need them, but once you've been on one, you want to do it again and again. The word safari means to go underneath African skies in search of big game. So that is what we're doing. We're under African skies and we're going in search of big game. Once you come here and you walk around in this area or drive around this area, the smells, the feelings, you see your first wild lion, your first wild leopard, an African elephant really, really close, it'll change your life. It really, really will. There's lots of people who watch this show every single day for years and years and years they absolutely love it and the people who come to africa come again and again and again seb and i are fortunate that they pay us to do this <laughs> it's terrible i know someone's got to do it someone's got to do it you know so we are walking we looking for that male lion because he is the kind of individual who would love snap up that impala that James has found. He was looking this morning for anything he can eat. And this time of year, the males that are fighting, are killing each other, getting caught, they're completely losing sight of everything that's going on around them. It makes them easy to catch. And I think James wants to tell you more about that. So what we did was we got out of the car and we came to have a look here. Now this is not a rotting carcass and so it's relatively safe for us to touch with our hands without putting on gloves. Ideally we should have gloves but I don't have any in the car and so I'm just going to be careful to make sure that I wash my hands before I put them anywhere near my face. But he's a fresh carcass. I don't think he's died of disease but I don't know that. If he has died of disease, that disease could be on him still, and so we would want to wash our hands before we put them anywhere near our faces. So just remember that if you're ever out in the wilderness trying to figure out what's happened to an animal that you find dead. I, I maintain that I think this animal has died from fighting. Now what we can see, there are a few things we can see. First of all is that there is a lot of dung here. Can you see that, Vim? So there's a whole lot of dung here, which means he let go of this dung. He, as they, what we call it is he loosed his bowels as he died. And that's a common response from mammals. What happens is that all their muscles relax and the, basically they just go to the loo. They make their last poop, if you like. 
Then if we look around here, we can see that there is signs of some kind of movement. Now, what that probably means is that he fell over and he was kicking his legs. So he didn't just die suddenly. But there is no evidence of much more of a struggle but for this kind of pushed over grass. And I'm not sure if you're even able to see that. Can you see over here? Or was that bush in your way? So it looks to me like there was a fight here. I don't think that the predator was involved because I cannot see any bite marks on this animal and I cannot see why the predator would have left this area and there were vultures on the ground when we arrived. Now if there was a predator around here they would never have tolerated having vultures around like that so I don't think that's what's happened. What I think's happened is that he's either cracked his skull and his brain has basically ceased to function, he's hit his head so hard that his brain stopped working, or he's been stabbed somewhere by another horn but I can't find any evidence of that. What I will say though, if you look over here, and you look here that there is evidence, you can see that kind of, um, this, this sort of powder that's coming off when I scrape it. Can you see that, Vim? This kind of yellowy stuff. That is bark from a tree. A tree like this, not probably not that one, like this one here. And he's been scraping his head against the trees over the last little while to show his dominance. And so he's clearly been a rutting impala. He's been a male that has been fighting with other male impalas. So whether he's cracked his skull or not, I don't know. I can't feel anywhere where he might have. But I suspect that that is possible. Because they hit themselves so very hard. There is one wound on his neck here, but it doesn't look to me that that was made by a predator. So that's what I think happened. It's possible that a very shy leopard is in the trees here somewhere waiting for us to go away. But as I say, there were vultures on the ground, which makes it very unlikely. So that's what's happened there. Let me plug in, see if you have any questions. And then I think we'll leave this rather sort of... Um, not very cheerful scene. See what else we can find somewhere that's a bit more cheerful than that. Okay, on we go. <laughs> My plan from here is to go up towards a waterhole, see what we can find there. It is quite a warm afternoon. Uh, Ralph has got more mammals for you. Now, everyone, I've just, um, it's very, it's very difficult to uh, catch up with these animals over here uh, because these are kudu and they like to be in the thickets. So we've just come up a little bit and we just want to catch up with them. I can't get very close to them, so we have to come up from far and just see if we can not scare them, but also at the same time try to get a view on them. And these are kudu. The ones without horns are the females. And remember that the antelope that uh, don't have horns, when, when there's females that don't have horns with antelope, uh, like impala and kudu, it's only the males that have horns with both of them, they like to live in the bushes, so in the thick bush. And the only reason that the males have horns is to fight with each other. And so... It's the animals that stay out on the grasslands, out on the plains, that both males and females have horns, like the gazelle and the wildebeest, because they need to protect themselves from the lions out in the bush, out on the grasslands rather. But here in the bush, these animals will use the bush to jump in between the thickets and try and get away from predators rather than defend themselves with horns. And you can see those lovely white stripes on them as well. That helps to camouflage them when you're looking at them in the bush. It breaks up the outline of their body. So it makes it very difficult for a predator to be able to spot them in the bushes. See there, a little bit of tail flicking, and as I say, the only reason I'm parked so far away is because it's difficult to get close to them. They normally go into the thick bushes if you go anywhere near them, so we just have to try and be a little bit further away, and then at least they're relaxed. There's another one.
Braden, well, for the time being, it's it's still quite warm uh, at this time of day. So we normally do see a lot of the antelope or the deer-like animals. Um, but we are going to start see, seeing some more birds and things as it starts cooling down. And I'm going to head to the waterhole and try to see if we can... Um, spot some predators as well like some leopard and lion and those kind of animals that's what we're going to be looking for as we go along maybe if we're lucky we'll see a hyena who knows maybe even a honey badger all those kind of animals but we do have to be lucky now the kudu that we've just been seeing they will be eating only leaves so they bite leaves off all the little branches that they're walking past. With the impala, they will also eat leaves that we were watching before, but they can also eat grass and all sorts of things. That's why we find there's a lot more impala than there are kudu. Why? Because they can eat lots of different things. And the kudu, they only eat leaves. So the impala can survive in different places and all over the country whereas the kudu they only like staying in the bushes and eating leaves it's very special hey so i'm going to head on and let's see if we can find some predators but steve out on foot i wonder if he's got any predator clues to show us we're nearly in the area where we left that male line that's important for us to stay very close together yeah, the good chances are it's going to be lying in the shade because it's relatively warm right now. And if you're a big cat, that's what you do in this time of day. You just sleep. It's always quite something, even if we don't find him now. I love the feeling it gives you being on foot in the African wilderness. I'm not thinking about anything other than the moment. Hello Max, we're in in Juma in the Sabi Sands Greater Kruger National Park, northwest and northeastern side of South Africa. Not far from Mozambique. Oh, I think this was the one, eh, Herbie? Oh, we left him on top of this termite mound. He was hiding on top of there just like we were just now disappeared into the grass I think so let's go a bit further and make sure it's the right one no it's not this one Herbie it's the next one Evan so because it's warm right now you want to know what time of day predators usually come out to hunt basically what happens is that because it's hot now it's a lot of energy to move around so as it cools down, even if it's an overcast day and it's not hot, they can hunt. Or if they're hiding in the long grass here and an animal walks past, they can hunt. Um, but generally they hunt at night when it's cooler. They see perfectly at night. It's much more uh, sort of in their advantage to hunt at night because they see beautifully in the dark. But it doesn't mean that they won't hunt in the day. But if you had to statistically put it together, they move more during the daytime, in the night time, and in the day, they sleep. All day long, they sleep. Very, very lazy animals. Okay, well, an animal that this lion really liked to eat is with James. Yes, in fact, most predators out here would like to eat this including the human being that is a warthog and they are delicious if you ever eat one we don't eat them out here but I have eaten one before I was very hungry anyway that is a warthog the most I think uh, well shall we say underrated animal now what that means is that most people don't appreciate I don't think quite how special they are but I think they are very, very cute. I think that they do very well living out here, such short creatures, and yet they survive in such very big numbers. Now this particular one has got a youngster, and the youngster is just coming towards her now. It's actually very sweet, I don't know if you can see there. 
just behind that tree. And the little one is scared of us, but the mother is not. And in fact, I know this warthog sow, we call the female. She's been around here a lot before. And she is one of the very few that do not run away from the cars. So she's just carrying on eating. But the little one is afraid of us. But he doesn't know, should he run away? Because mum is not running away. You still see him at all? There he is. There's a little fellow. <laughs> Ella, a predator is an animal that preys on another animal. So a predator of warthogs would be lions, hyenas, leopards, sometimes wild dogs unusually, and even more unusually, cheetah. Those are predators. Oh, Steve on foot is very brave this afternoon. looking in. Okay, so he's... Boys and girls, we just got to stand very quietly now. That is a male lion on foot. Oh, he wasn't limping this morning, Hobie. Hobie seems to think he's slightly injured. Potentially run into confrontation with other males. Any big five animal like this is potentially dangerous on foot. So we need to just move back a little bit. He's a beautiful specimen. I reckon he's about three and a half or so. Watch out for the holes. The objects of bushwalk is to help find these animals. Not looking happy, eh, Johnny? I'll talk to you soon. Lions are potentially dangerous because they eat meat. They see us as a threat to their existence. They see us as a threat to their existence. And encountering them on foot normally in the daytime, they, they have a fear of us, so they normally move off. But he's not moving away, which means that, um, yeah, but he's okay now. We've given him some space. See, he just shook his head. But he's looking at us in the long grass. This is about as good as it gets with a lion on foot. You're not, you don't want to make him charge. You don't want to make him run at you and growl and snort. That does happen from time to time. But they're just trying to scare you, trying to make you move away. Once you've given them space, comfort zone, they relax a little bit. But see how invisible he is in the long grass there. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk on the radio and we're going to get someone with a vehicle to come in to actually look at this animal with the car. Much easier. That's how you get your best shots. Okay, well, we're going to maneuver around. Just move out a little bit. And while we do that, let's go and see James and his Boomba. Well, there is the Pumba. You can still, oh, no, she's, seen, yeah, she's still there, still eating away, which is very nice. <laughs> Isn't that exciting to see a male lion on foot? That is very unusual, everybody. And it is really very special indeed to have such a big predator on foot. And people often ask us, they say, you know, is it dangerous for us out here? Well, it would be dangerous if you didn't know how to react to a male lion like that. But of course, Steve is very experienced. And so is Herbert, the tracker that he's with. And so they are absolutely fine on foot with a male lion. Kerrigan, I think you're asking if I heard correctly if warthogs are killed with horns, is that right? Oh, are they pigs with horns? Well, no, they're not. No pigs have horns as far as I know, uh, but they do have tusks. And all pigs have got, to a greater or lesser extent, what we call tusks. And they are modified canines. Now, of course, that is probably meaningless to you. But if you think of the big, long teeth on, say, uh, a lion or your dog, 
If you've got dogs or cats at home, if you open their mouths, you'll know that they've got those long teeth. Those are called canines. And on a warthog, those canines are even longer, and they stick out sideways. And those are the ones that you can see on the top there and on the bottom. They've got top and bottom long canines, and all pigs have them, even domestic pigs. Not as long as warthogs, but they all have them, and they're very sharp, and that's how the pigs defend themselves, and of course how they manage to dig yeah, for tubers and delicious things like that under the ground. So they don't have horns, they've got tusks. All right, now Steve, still being very brave with his lion, let's go back and see. Yes, well, he, he gave us the initial signs of, of a sort of agitation and we gave him the space. We've moved away a bit, uh, he's in the shade. He's still making little low rumbling calls, but we're keeping our face to him. We're not turning our shoulder. That's very important in these situations. If you do ever encounter yourself out here on foot, the most important thing is never ever to panic, never ever to run. With cats, by running you just basically tell them that you're target and they will chase you. Your food and they'll chase you. Wow. Payson is a big male. He's only young still. He's only about three and a half, maybe four, somewhere around there. And he's probably on about 500, uh, about 480, maybe 450 pounds. He's a big boy. He's a very big boy. He's the largest carnivore in Africa. And he normally is not on his own. He sometimes is with his two brothers, which makes it even more impressive. This is a new male in from the north. Evan, yeah, you wouldn't know why they're not in packs. Well, they call them prides, and male lions form what we call coalitions, and that's to sort of dominate other males and to look after as many females as they can. And last week we had him uh, very close by with his two brothers, uh, but there are four bigger males that occur in the area, or older males, should I say, and there seems to be some confrontation between them. We're not sure what happens off the dark. We don't follow them all the time. We just found him this morning on his own. Herbie thinks he looks a bit injured. He looked fine this morning. I think maybe he's been lying on his leg or something and he's just got a bit of a limp. But um, that we can check out later. But this morning he looked fine to me. So I think he's just been on his uh, lying when you get a bit of a, a funny leg when you've been lying for too long. Evan, you want to know if there's any animals that eat big cats? Well, when a big cat gets killed, maybe by a lion, uh, even if it is a lion, sometimes the lions eat them. Sometimes leopards eat big cats as well. Hyenas will definitely eat a dead lion, and vultures will eat anything, anything meat. So it really depends, you know. Sometimes lions kill other lions and then they don't eat them. Sometimes they do. It's really hard to say in the moment. Like sometimes male lions kill cubs, you know, they eat them and sometimes they don't eat them. It really depends on the day. Um, there's stories out and documentaries out of a leopard that's had her cubs killed and then she's eaten the cub. So it's really, really strange how it works and what's going on in the animal's mind when it happens is very hard to, to understand. But you must bear in mind, boys and girls, this is a 100% wild lion. And he is beautiful. Kai just disappears in the long grass there. Wow, Dylan, he can cover about 21 feet in a second at charging speed, so he can run at about 45, maybe 42 miles an hour. That's pretty quick. They are sprinters. They cover short distance very quickly, but male lions are actually generally quite relaxed on foot because you know, they're all bravado, they're all brave, it's the females you've got to watch out for because they generally have cubs, they generally have something to say about you getting close to their cubs. There's a male, you just, you want to come here, come here, I might shout at you, I might not. <laughs> but this is fantastic. Hello, Corey. You want to know why he's got long hair on his head? Well, it's going to get longer than that. Um, 
when when they get older, the male lions they develop what we call a mane, which is that hair around the neck, and that helps to to minimise when they fight. There's lots of it energy or lots of attack happens on the neck and the throat and it protects the neck and head against the blows taken by other lions and also um, for example this guy's got quite a young male and he's still developing when he sees a bigger male who's got much more hair on his on his head and on his mane he's more impressive and it's more of a sort of a of a uh, intimidation strategy they don't want to fight every time they see another male sometimes the mane itself keeps the other male from fighting him sometimes they develop these long black manes and they look very impressive but from behind they don't actually look that big but from the front they look enormous so it's often just intimidation but the primary reason is for defending against when they fight so you can also see the age of lions by that While we catch our breath, let's catch up with Ralph and see what he's been up to. Yeah, how amazing is that, everybody? That Steve's found some lions on foot, and well, uh, oh, there's a little, there's a little antelope that we've got, but he's one of the antelope that do run away very quickly. Oh, there he goes. You see, you've got to be very quick with these little guys that's called a stienbok stien meaning stone in afrikaans so it's because he always stops and acts like a little stone before he runs off into the bush there he goes that's one of the smaller little antelope so wonderful that we've seen some lions and we've seen some impala kudu and now we've got the small little guys as well now, Clayton, the grass is so high because is because uh, we've we've just got to the end of summer, so we're in our autumn months. I think for you guys, where you are exactly in the northern hemisphere, you'll be going into spring now, so your grass will just be starting to grow. Ooh, here we've got another species of antelope. I just want to try and get a nice position that we can see them nicely. They are moving. And so the grass here has grown. It's, it's not going to be growing anymore. Slowly but surely it's going to be dying off quite soon. But uh, here's some nyala. Nyala, a little bit different to the kudu that we saw earlier. These are nyala females. Slightly different. They're a little bit more brown than the females. Rather than grey. Now, Evan, they hide in the grass because they need to keep away from the predators like the lions and the leopards. Now, this is a Nyala male. The ones that walked in front of him were all the girls. Now, he's the big boy. Look at that. And he's very good looking, isn't he? And he needs to be because uh, he's got to look after those beautiful girls, doesn't he? And, well, so that's it. They need to hide in the bush to stay away from predators, and that's also what they eat. So they'll be eating the leaves and a little bit of the grass sometimes, uh, but uh, also trying to just hide away from the predators as well. So I saw some elephant tracks a little bit earlier, and there's some big elephant dung just on the road in front of us. So maybe we'll get lucky and see some of our largest land mammals the African elephant. I'm hoping that maybe they'll be going for a drink down just by the dam where we're going towards. Hopefully we'll catch them down there. We can't promise anything because here we're in the wild. We're not in a zoo. Now Andrew, a lot of the animals are faster than the lions, but the lions, they can they can go on, on a small distance, they can go very fast. So the, the animals that, they, that the lions are chasing, they need, the lions need to get very close to them before they go for them because they can go fast for a very short space of time. But if the lions run from too far away, the animals will be able to get away. So that's the reason why the lions and the leopards, they need to get very close before they pounce because then they've got a very good chance of catching their prey. Otherwise, the antelope are going to just get away. 
And the, the lion and the leopard will have run for nothing. He'll be all tired. He'll still be hungry. And uh, he'll have no food, which would be silly of him. Hey, so he needs to try and get very close before he pounces. It's a little bit quiet over here. Okay, so I'm heading down towards the dam and let's hope there's some elephants there. I'm going to carry on towards the water. Um, but James, my friend, is also out on the vehicle and I wonder what little clues he may have for you on his side. Right, everyone, sorry about uh, the lack of me in the picture there, but I thought I'd come up and tell you about this mound that I'm standing on. I'm not going to tell you about what built it because many of you of course will know that this was built by termites but what is interesting and given that you are in a science class right now all of you what's interesting is the soil that it's made of. Now one of the most important parts of this whole area that we can see here the low felt of South Africa which means the lowlands is the soil and this soil is very poor and it, for agriculture. So if you can see around me on this termite mound, you can see it's a very pale white color. And that's normally indicative or it shows that there are very few chemicals in the soil. And of course, plants need good chemicals to grow out of the soil and they need to be fertilized. And that's why farmers put fertilizer on their fields. But the soil here is very poor and it hasn't been fertilized naturally by volcanoes for thousands and thousands of years. So those very fertile areas of the world have normally had ash from volcanoes falling on the soil and fertilizing it naturally. And that has not happened over here. And that is why the soil is pale. And it's also why this area is such a magnificent wildlife area because if it was any good for growing something that a human being could sell, like maize or wheat or barley or something like that, then you can be sure that people would be growing things here. Just looking in this hole, nothing there, I don't think. It's good, sometimes snakes live in those holes. And so it's important to understand that although we come normally to an area like this to look at lions and leopards and elephants and impalas and warthogs and that sort of thing, it's important to understand that none of that would be possible without the soil. It starts with the soil, then it goes to the trees and the grass, and eventually it goes to the wonderful animals that we have here. And so what I want you to take from this little lesson is that the soil here is very poor for agriculture, but it's good for the wild animals out here that have evolved to live and to survive on the vegetation that grows from this very poor soil. Isn't that quite interesting? I think it's quite interesting. <laughs> Evan, we do sometimes, we don't all the time check on the animals when we're not filming, but if we really want to find a leopard or there's a leopard sitting in a tree close by to the camp, then sometimes we'll go and have a look. But you know, we are out in the bush for six hours every day. That's quite a long time to be out in the bush. And so most of the time when we're not out on safari like we are with you, well, then we're not looking for animals. We're normally doing other things. We're going to drive down towards where Steve's lion is and have a look at him but it's going to take a little while to get there. So I suppose the other thing we can talk about, if I can't find you an actual animal, is the season. And of course we're going into winter now and you guys are going into summer. And I'm sure you're very happy to be going into summer because it's a beautiful time of the year. And winter, well, winter out here, believe it or not, is probably our best time of year because it doesn't get very cold and every day is clear and blue and beautiful like this one is. And if you want to see how it's becoming winter, if we look at this tree over here, you can see that the trees or the leaves are turning yellow. And they're turning yellow because, of course, it's what you would call the fall, what we call the autumn. 
Evan, those big termite mounds don't just house one termite, you see. Evan, they house many, many millions of termites. And so in the same way that one person can live in a small hut, well, millions of people need whole cities and apartment blocks to live in. And it's exactly the same for the termites. Termites, there are millions of them living in all those mounds, and so they need a big house because there's so many of them. In the same way that uh, if you go to New York City, look, there's another termite mound, there are millions of termites in there. If you go to New York City, there are millions of people living there, of course. And so because there are millions of people living there, they have to have lots and lots of buildings. And lots of them are very big, big, tall apartment blocks that can look after a lot of people. Okay, let us continue down the road. We'll try and get to the lion before the end of your lesson. Now, why would do that? Ralphie's got something else to show you. Well, I'm up to exactly what I was up to just now. I'm still looking for anything that moves, but in particular, for the moment, some elephants. I went past a small water hole, and uh, now there weren't any elephants there, so I'm going to go and look for another water hole and see if they're coming down to drink. Because it's that time of day when elephants would want to go and drink, because it's quite warm, it's quite hot, and elephants like to drink lots of water every day, especially when it's very hot like it is today. So that's why I'm going to all the water points and trying to see if the elephants are around. And that's uh, lots of signs of them all around, lots of tracks along the road, but we're just moving up behind them and we just want to catch up with them. Uh, Ella, most of the males that I've shown you have horns um, because they live in the bushes, in the thick, where there's lots of trees, uh, you know. Like, it's not like in the Maasai Mara where there's lots of grass everywhere over big distances. Um, in those places, that's where you have like the wildebeest and the gazelle and the topi. Those, both male and female, have horns because they protect themselves mostly against lions and cheetah that are going to hunt them out on the grasslands. And so they don't have any other way of defending themselves except with their horns but here in the bushes here where there's a lot more trees and thick uh, vegetation or bushes uh, the animals can jump through the thorns and through the branches and so only the males have horns with those kind of animals because they need to fight with other males that's all so they they have those horns for that reason and the other ones jump through the bushes and through the thorns as their defense. So that's why there's a difference and you can actually tell between the two different kinds of animals whether they live in the bush or whether they live on the grasslands by whether both male and female have horns or if it's only the males. So that's interesting, hey? Okay, so still going to try and find us some elephants everybody that's my aim for now but um, while I'm looking for them off to Steve and what it was like with the lion thank you Ralph it's always nice to find an animal you're looking for on foot I know we did leave him in the area this morning but there's such a good opportunity that he would have moved off towards the dam towards the waterhole it does happen, and then we have to spend hours trying to find them again. So it's just as well that when we got up there to that termite mound, instead of going straight towards it, we did a big loop around the back. And I'm sorry if we didn't get the beginning of that live segment, but it was getting a little bit intense in there. But fun, nonetheless. It really gets the heart going. They say to be a real man in Africa, you need to be able to stand and stare a lion in the eye and not run away. We did it, Seb. Good man. Now we're going to go and check some pans and some water holes and see what else is about this afternoon. Max, you want to know if there's any animals that are friends? Well, out here we find certain hornbills that like to follow the mongooses around because the mongooses 
stir up food and then the hornbills capitalize on anything that they might have uh, missed or or chased um but none of the predators are friends really i think you know predators they compete with each other so much that there's no time for being friends really and there's always interactions between them you find impala zebra wildebeest kudu waterbug all hanging out together it's purely because there's more eyes and more ears to see lions like that approaching but whether it means they like each other or not is a different story Okay, well, thank you to the schools for joining us this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed Safari Live and with us on foot and in the vehicles. Until next time, have a beautiful, beautiful morning. And on that note, we're going to go back over to James. Now, good afternoon again to the rest of our normal viewers. Normal, you're all normal. Everyone's normal, of course. There is no abnormal, but our regular viewers, better way of putting it, as I bump over the Vuyatela Dam. We're going to see if we can't find the male lion that Steve and Herbert found a little bit earlier. Please do talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and, of course, the chat stream on YouTube. You can send through us any questions you might have. Oops. Bumpy today. Now, I think they went down here. And then we should be able to find the lion. I think he's just in here somewhere. Now, my question is where, of course, are the other two evoker males? I haven't heard any reports of them and there was some talk that they had been chased off by some Birmingham boys but I'm not sure where those rumours come from. Hmm? Oh I see. Uh, Viam says Tinio had quite a big belly when we saw him last week. Uh, Would you think he ate an avoca male? He had some avocado, did he? Ah. Right, Viam says yes, exactly. I, I'm going to disagree with Viam there. I don't think that Tinyal, the Birmingham Boyle, ate <laughs> one of the evokers. All right, I got that we must link to Ralph, who's got a, an approach to life that is something of kind of slowly. <laughs> well, I'm not the only one, because here is a fellow that carries his house around with him everywhere he goes and well we haven't been able to find a tortoise oh sorry we haven't been able to find a leopard but we have been able to find a tortoise and not any tortoise a leopard tortoise and look at that he, he can actually move quite fast when he wants to but just imagine carrying your house around with you on your back and it's actually part of your back so whenever there's any danger, he can just pop himself back into his shell. And generally, he's very safe once he does that. Especially once they've made it to this age. And then they are quite safe with that very big shell of theirs. And these tortoises can swim as well. So I wonder, I think he probably had a little drink before we saw him. So we didn't see any elephants coming down for a drink, but we have seen a leopard tortoise here at Treehouse Dam, the Treehouse Water Point. Lovely spot site it is. I can see there's tracks that the elephants were here, so I think we've missed them. They were already here a little bit earlier. We already had a drink a little bit earlier in the day. So anyway, a little bit quiet here. Nonetheless, we are going to carry on and see what else we can find. At least we spotted a nice little leopard tortoise there. Those leopard tortoises, they'll be eating on all sorts of vegetation and sometimes they even eat uh, lion or leopard poo. Now that's really strange, hey? But why would they do that? Well, they do that because they need lots of calcium because of that shell that they make to go over them. They need to eat some poo sometimes from, from the lions and leopards because lions and leopards eat bones. So there's lots of calcium in their food and that will then come out in their poo and the tortoises get some help from the lion and leopard to make their shell. So that's quite interesting, hey? But we don't want to be going around eating poo. Yuck! 
But for the tortoise, that's the way that he gets some help to make that very strong house of his on his back. Now, where are you elephants? Clifford, the largest tortoise species that we have is that one that we were just looking at now. That one was a very small one, but they can get much bigger than that. And I know that there are some that can even live over a hundred years and reach weights of about 150 pounds. Wow, that's very big, hey? So these leopard tortoises, they are the biggest ones that we have in Africa and uh, well they do get quite big indeed but I'm sure that there are some bigger tortoises in other places especially tropical countries like the Galapagos or Madagascar they have some giant tortoises that get much bigger than these ones but uh, these are very common and in general they're about that big but they can get much bigger and they can weigh a lot as well but it takes a very long time for them to grow so you don't often see the very big ones and out here also with the little ones when they hatch they can also get eaten by some birds and sometimes the lions also do eat them even though the tortoises sometimes eat the lions poo which helps them uh, lions can also eat the smaller ones because their shell isn't so hard so they can actually bite into it and then they'll eat a tortoise remember most tortoises walk around on land and the terrapins are the ones in fresh water now, Gigi Master, if a lion eats grass, they do do that sometimes to help their digestion. I don't know if you know at home, you might see your dogs or your cats that you have at home. Sometimes they eat grass as well, but that's when they normally have an upset stomach. So they'll eat grass and that helps them to either vomit to get out whatever stuck inside their stomach or it will come uh, in the poo but it helps to to settle their stomach so there's nothing wrong with an animal eating grass that normally eats meat it does help them just to settle their tummy hey they don't have doctors like we do and sometimes if they want to help themselves that's what they'll do they'll go and eat some grass when they've got a sore belly you know sometimes when you get stomach cramps and your tummy sore when you ate something that didn't agree with you and then you feel oh but then what does what happens mommy gives you some medicine hey but with these animals they don't have mommy to give them medicine so their medicine is to go and eat some grass that's a very good way of treating yourself. Imagine you could do that. Now, seeing as we were talking about cats and eating grass, well, Steve's the one that's been watching cats. Let's get his opinion on it. Hmm, cats love to eat grass. Well, I find they eat grass to throw up the furball that they've ingested, especially lions, because they eat so much and so quickly in their ravenous attempt to get as much in as they possibly can, and by eating grass makes them vomit. And there what we have is a vertebrae of an animal, I'm going to guess by the size, it's probably a buffalo, and in the area here, that is all that we can find remaining of this poor soldier that was invariably eaten by something, whether it was killed by a lion or whether it died of natural causes, is hard to establish from the <laughs> from the one bone. But talking about eating things, a lot of animals will actually feed on the bone. Something called osteophagy. You find it more into the dry season, especially pregnant females needing a little bit more calcium in their diet. So they'll actually nibble on the bone to get all the different calcium inside that they're struggling to get out of the environment. Tortoises will feed on uh, hyena dung. How gross does that sound? But to get the calcium that they need to develop their scoots and their shell. And um, who else? Porcupine? Warthog? I've seen giraffe eating giraffe bone. Very crazy, but 
bone is bone and you know you need that nutrients you'll eat them so marvelous that that's what's left out here and uh, yeah we have obviously moved off from the male line and Seb has nearly decapitated me again with the aerial on top of his head <laughs> and we are on a mission in towards the east we don't know what we're going to find but we're going to be looking at all the little things we found a lion this afternoon so now it is just time to relax and focus on some plants some tracks some dung bones as you know and um, we're going to keep walking don't get caught up in the buffalo thorn there Seb the very nice buffalo thorn coming up here and uh, the Afrikaans name is a blink blar wachebiki which basically means shiny leaf wait a minute and it's a very tasty leaves in fact it's my afternoon snack I missed lunch so I just quickly need to grab a couple hmm you can see how well browsed it is the entire top of the tree here has been really really eaten by by giraffe pot potentially even kudu and he has been broken probably by an elephant take care why are bones rise i have no idea that's probably just the color of the mineral calcium makes up seb why are bones white well they go white in the sun when they calcify why they're white i actually have no idea why is the sky blue <laughs> Okay, well, hopefully James has managed to find that male lion again. Let's go see if he has. No, no, James has not managed to find the male lion. James feels like he might go on a slightly wild goose chase at the moment. All the male lion has moved, I'm not sure. But Rexon is here also trying to help. Herbert is still trying to guide both of us in by the radio. Oops. There are obviously a lot of large and deeply irritating stumps in this area. The elephants have made themselves an enormous mess all over. There are artfark holes everywhere. Very intimidating. Ah, a very sad question to have been uh, to have asked Diana and I'll tell it with a story I was watching a video the other day uh, from the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation and they had a, a chap called I forget his name but he became very famous in 19 in the 60s for owning a lion called Christian the lion and he in fact bought this lion in a store in London as a cub Anyway, eventually they reintroduced him to a lion pride in Kenya, and it was, I think, a rare example of a lion actually surviving in the wild after reintroduction. Big male lion, and his name was Christian, and he was involved with the Adamsons around there. And the story there is that what happened, or, I mean, the reason I'm telling you the story is that this fellow said that when he basically dropped off Christian the lion in Kenya in 1969 there were 390,000 lions left in the wild now there are fewer than 20,000 so in almost that 50 year period 49 year period we've managed to lose more than what is that I mean that's more than 90% more than 90% of the lions. Uh, I don't know how accurate his figure was of 390,000, but the figure of 20,000 is probably pretty accurate. And I think that uh, it is just a travesty that humanity has allowed once, or the most, once the most widely spread mammal in the world to have been decimated to that extent is just a really shameful example of how we have interacted with the world and I mean that's just one species one iconic species no doubt but you can just imagine how many others have been decimated by our activities as human beings now we should be quite close now and here comes Rexon he seems to think that he knows where he's going
Trish, uh, you say, so what a big drop. Yeah, absolutely. Can you see him? <laughs> no, Rex can't see him. So, Trish, yeah, an absolutely horrendous drop. I don't know that that figure of 390,000 is true. Uh, I'm not sure of its veracity, but there certainly were a huge number more than the 20,000, the paltry 20,000 we have now. And I often think that, you know, as human beings, we tend to think that uh, a number like that is quite large. 20,000 is quite a large number by our normal daily standards. We're just going to follow Rex in here. But it really is a minute number when you consider the number of human beings there are in just a suburb or a borough of New York, for example, or in Johannesburg, where there are more than five million people just in little Johannesburg. It's, it's quite frightening to think how few lions there are. And if you compare them with the numbers of human beings, you know, human beings are more than seven billion now. Seven billion is not a number that you and I, I don't believe, have any conception of. We can't conceive of a thousand million or seven thousand million people. We don't understand how astronomically high that is. And if you couple that as well with the fact that if you go to the IUCN database, which is the red list, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, they have this red list which classifies every organism as, or on the scale of uh, non-threatened or unthreatened, least concern to extinct. Lions, I think, are on the near threatened list or threatened list. I don't think they're considered endangered. I don't think that the white rhino is even considered endangered, which is uh, frightening, I think, when you consider how few there are. Now, I'm sure that this driving is startlingly, uh, startlingly entertaining for you, but I'm afraid I think that this lion has absconded. So we will continue searching and uh, go across to somebody with an animal or something decent to say. Well, everyone, I'm still on the search um, and uh, I'm getting slightly frustrated because I'm not having any joy. So I think I'm going to change my tactics. I'm not going to be thinking like an animal anymore. I'm just going to think like me and I'm going to go where I would like to go, which is down into the Mlolwati. I like that area. So let's try that tactic. I think um, I've been now for two, three days trying my hardest to find leopard and lion and really coming up mostly unsuccessful so and they're around the tracks and signs are there I've just um, the way that I've normally been finding them not been getting any luck so I think what I need to do head down to the river into the Umlawati search the drainage lines there and well if we don't find any animals, at least we see some different trees and there's probably some monkeys around there. Maybe we'll see the odd owl and all sorts. So that's what I feel like doing now. And that's what I'm going to do. So we're heading down towards quarantine. So back into the central area once again and then down past Vuyotela Dam. Maybe there'll be something probably like Wildebeest Impala near to the dam there the water point and then uh, from then on I'm going to duck down into the drainage lines and move along like that. I think that's the best idea. Now Matthew, good question that you've asked. Um, the only one in particular that is very common are the cuckoos, which uh, lay their eggs, they brood parasites, so they lay their eggs in other uh, birds' nests. And uh, so that's, that's uh, one case where you'll, you'll find uh, one species raising a different species young. But it's very rare for, to find any other animals actually doing that because you won't particularly find impala raising zebra calves. Uh, you won't find buffalo raising rhino calves. 
Well, I mean, this is, it's not impossible, but uh, I've never seen that before. Um, one of the, the animals that humans actually make do that is um, if we want to raise guinea fowl, uh, then we'll put some wild guinea fowl eggs with the chickens in the coop and uh, then they will hatch growing up raised by the chickens and thinking that they are chickens but they they pretty much are the bush chickens because they are almost exactly the same in terms of habit and lifestyle so very easy match there but um, it's difficult to say if there's any other kind of match up where um, you have different species raising uh, young that are not their own so yes in a particular environment and here's Steph hi Steph <laughs> Steph's out always working doing the administration work that is uh, I don't envy him at all lots of work behind the scenes so I'll rather be out here on the vehicle and doing the business like this uh, than uh, sitting and signing paperwork all day. Wow, I don't envy him, not one bit. But yes, so if any of you know of any other animals that might raise different species young, then let us know because I'm not quite sure I know of any others except for those tactics where they actually uh, press for another species to do it for them. Let's watch this impala. He's making, look at that. I love watching them when they're rutting. Look at that. They're making lots of noise. He's, I think he's doing it to a group of females. They're always watching. Where are the females? What's going on? He's not worried about himself. He's not worried about eating. He's not worried about sleeping, drinking. All he is worried about is females and chasing away the other males or potentially fighting with them. And that kind of roar that he was doing is all part of that display. And I don't know, he's standing in the shade, but he is a magnificent individual. And how many males would have already sort of gone through the line uh, would be interesting to know because as I say once they establish themselves as the dominant male they could keep a group of females for up to about a week but at that point they're so ragged they run uh, running around keeping these females within the group chasing away the males not worrying about themselves not drinking properly not feeding properly and their condition drops drastically so by that stage there could be another male that's established himself within the bachelor herd let's listen there listen i hope you can hear that really funny sound he's making the wind is also blowing in our direction so it might be quite soft there he is. He's not doing it anymore for now. Right, let's just see if he does it anymore and if he gets into battle with another male. I just want to see what he does next before we head down to Voyatella Dam. You see, there's no feeding going on whatsoever. He's just looking for girls and looking for guys to fight with. Anyway, it's gone a little bit quiet there. Okay, everyone, I'm going to head down towards Voyatella Dam. Since everybody was happy to see Steph, yes, I don't think he's been on the show for quite some time. And as I say, working hard behind the scenes, getting all sorts going with all sorts of different projects, um, and as well as Safari Live, uh, keeping that running nicely and keeping us comfortable in the camp as well. So we owe a lot of gratitude to, to Steph. Um, but while I head down towards the dam here, I wonder how it's going with the guy out on foot. Yeah, well, we have found a rubbish pile of what appears to be termite body waste parts. 
and there are some small reddish ants busy scavenging through. We're on a bit of a termite mound now. I've never ever seen anything quite like this. I mean, this is the size of it. Here you can see my finger. It's all very small. It just looks like the carapaces of some termites have been scattered outside of the of the den. That last waste bit, seemingly lots of heads, you see, popped up again. They're just like it's like a rubbish chute just popping up from the inside. And the ants are the scavengers going through the pile looking for any bits and pieces that haven't been through the process inside. Because termites, when they die, invariably most of their body parts are recycled back into the soil, into the nutrients. But obviously this is the chitinous head, like the prawn scales you find in prawns. So the, the head bit is really the hardest part to break down. And so the rest of the body is decomposing. And just that outer head part seems to be the order of the day. And what nourishment these little ants are getting from it is quite, quite marvelous, in fact. And those are grains of sand you can see as well. It's very, very small, folks very very small and we just happened upon it as we stood in the shade of this termite mound don't forget to send through your questions to hashtag safari live or follow us on the YouTube stream well, some of you nine years old we don't really have any colorful ants all our ants that I know of are all black or red Nothing really of any coloration, um, but lots of other funny, colorful insects. But how nice is this view through the grass, Seb? That's quite gorgeous. So in the morning light, Samu, we saw that male lion this morning hiding in grass just like this. It was really quite gorgeous. But yeah, so I haven't, I don't know of any really colorful, bright, contrasting ants. Um, lots of wasps and beetles and things like that can be quite contrasting, but no ants. We're going to leave our garbage pile here, the wastes of the bush, far better than our wastes that are polluting the ocean. Well, it seems like James has managed to find our line. Let's go see how flat he is. He's so flat we cannot actually see him anymore. He was up very briefly, uh, but unfortunately Ralph was looking at termites at the time, and then while he was looking at termites, the thought of Ralph looking at termites bored him so profoundly that he went to sleep. Now, that's obviously because he has not met Ralph. He has not listened to Ralph tell a story about something like a termite, and uh, this is why he is now flat. And so flat that we can't see him, but he is there. I promise. He was up. Herbert had to bring us in here. Oh. And it was Steve with the termites, not Ralph. I see. Did you see that shaking there, Viam? It was astounding, just in there. There was a bit of a main shaking going on. Oh, there's some... No. Do we get... Can we see him? Yes. There's movement there. That is a lion, everybody. That's a large male lion of the Avoca Coalition. Where the other two are, we don't know. Just to give you a brief introduction to the Avokas, they are, of course, three, and two of the others are not around. We don't know where they are. I'm afraid, Strawhead, I missed that question. The game driver's going ballistic in my ear. Can you go again with that, please, Lucas? Oh. Definitely, Strawhead, there was more prey because there was more space. I don't think the density of prey was any higher during the time that, uh, you know, when there were so many more lions, but the space available to them was that much higher. And I was talking to a guy in Kenya, uh, a Kenyan, oh, I think he's Kenyan. Anyway, he lived in Kenya a long time. He's done a huge amount of research there. And he was saying how, you know, throughout Kenya, lions used to be pretty much free roaming. And although they had national parks, and they like they do now, there were no fences around them. And there were no fences between national parks either, which meant that they didn't have the kind of mosaic of fenced patchwork landscape that we have here in a place like South Africa. It was all kind of open, which meant that there was free roaming space for the lions to move. And that's all ended now. People are, what do they call it? There's something... 
They're calling it the divide or something, the... I forget what they call it, but basically everyone's being f or fencing their own little patches in Kenya as they get title deed to the land. There's a lot of good socio-economic um, socio reasons for doing that, but they're not good for wildlife fences. And I think that's happened throughout parts of Africa. And of course, since 1969, the population of Africa has exploded. It's just gone over about 1.1, I think 1.2 billion people. And back then it was probably about 800 million, which of course was not particularly high compared with what it is now. And so the space for animals has just declined massively. And so while I don't believe there was any more prey for them to eat, there was absolutely more space for them and their prey to exist. I mean, it really is a depressing thing, and it's the one thing that governments seem inescapably poor at dealing with and for some reason uh, unwilling to address, and that, of course, is the subject of population control. And it's only when it gets to the dire situation like you had in China that uh, these sort of draconian laws get brought in. But if throughout Africa you will find very little talk of... Uh, you know, one or two child families or population control or family planning or anything like that. You'll find very little in any kind of government uh, program that suggests perhaps we aren't making too many of ourselves. And that, uh, that essentially is the problem. Angie, I know that it must seem absolutely impossible for you to understand how, from what you can see there, I can tell that that is an evoker male lion. Uh, I don't blame you at all. It is because we have seen him with his head up, and it is because we watched him the whole of this morning, and because of that we recognize him. We know he is part of the Avoca male coalition, uh, a coalition of three male lions, as I said, this one bigger than the other two, and in fact he seems to be often just a little bit further away from them uh, than they are from each other for some reason. I don't know. He might be a cousin rather than a brother. The other two could easily be litter mates. So we just know him because we recognize him. And they're just starting to come into this area. Quite possibly will take over this territory, hitherto owned by the Birmingham boys, who have, well, spread themselves too thin, I think. They've gone down towards the Sand River, where there's a huge territory being vacated by the demise of an ancient and very well ancient in lion terms coalition of male lions called the Majingalan. And they've just got old and decrepit and popped off one by one. So the Birminghams have gone down there, opening up a space for the Avoca males, these young three. I think they, they're lucky to have a territory or the possibility of a territory at their current age. We think they are probably about three and a half years old at this stage. Let's have one last look at that particularly fine patch of grass where he's chosen to lie down, and then I think we'll probably head out from here and maybe pop back a little bit later. Oh, was that some more movement there, Vian? Yes. Now, I found as my father gets slightly older, he likes to sleep even more during the, the afternoons. Uh, and, uh, well, you might think from the amount of sleep that this lion I is doing during the afternoon that three and a half was about the oldest they could get. But well, Jack, Jack, believe it or not, they get even older than this. And they only get to, on average, of about 11 years, we think, in this area, probably 10 or 11 years, often less than that. The oldest lion that I know of in the Sabi Sands was a 17-year-old male yeah. of the Sparta pride down in the sort of central Sabi Sand region. Look at that magnificent lion picture there. Oh, goodness gracious, it's an ear. Uh, he was 17 years old, and I, I mean, he looked pretty ropey by the time he was 17. But their age very much is determined by the amount of pressure exerted on them by rival males. And I think that's one of the main reasons that the Majingalan coalition survived for as long as they did. Right, I'm being set upon by a grasshopper here. Oh, he's gone. Okay, let's forget about the grasshopper. Go from the grasses to a tree. A dead tree? It was once an opthorn?
And uh, what has happened to it is that the bark has been stripped. And this is something that we are seeing a lot happening in the Greater Kruger National Park, where elephants are stripping the bark of knob thorns. And these trees and marula trees are disappearing at an alarming rate. And what we do know about knob thorns is they are generally the preferred tree species for vultures and large raptors to nest in. So we're seeing a decline in the nesting sort of density of vultures and large raptors. Whereas areas that are adjacent to the park where there's no elephant, there are huge colonies of whiteback vultures busy nesting. So, but this is a natural process, bear in mind, folks. But because there are fences, there's no ability for the elephants to migrate like these ants are doing up and down the wood. They're migrating up and down, feeding and doing whatever they're doing. But this tree itself will form a habitat tree and probably stand for a number of years, forming holes and cavities for a number of nesting birds, insects, all sorts of life forms. So a natural process, but by no means... Um, so by no means should we condemn it, but if we are seeing these trees disappearing at an alarming rate. So it's important to understand what's going on there and how do we conserve. We need bigger areas, we need large areas. And as we go along, you'll see there's lots of knob thorns. There's another one, another one behind, there's another one there. Just in this area, there's five that we can see. One, two, three at the back, four, and then in the sunshine, number five. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's an interesting topic and it's always open to debate. What do people think? But you can go on for hours about the elephant debate. And bear in mind what we are also seeing is because of the number of impala around, there's no baby knobthorns coming through. We don't find them. And when we do find them, what's to stop the in huge herd of impala moving through from eating it up? So this is a natural process, but the recruitment of it is not happening. That is the problem. That's what we need to pay attention to. But before we run away from us, we've got a tree quiz time. Da -da 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 -da. And here is the tree. I'm going to let Seb get right in on the leaves. And let me tell you, let's see who out there can tell me what tree this is. Hashtag Safari Live. Let us know what tree it is. As a nice example of this one. That is Rexon from Voyatella just driving past. Well, I'm going to take this leaf sample with me so that we can discuss it once I get the answers in. And while we do that, let's go over to Ralph and see how he's doing. So everyone, I've gotten down into the riverbed, the Mlolwati, and look at this. We've got wonderful Tamburti trees, jackalberries, the Odnyala tree, uh, we've got some gardenias, we've got all sorts, that's why I like it down here and that's why I've come down. Uh, as I said, not having much luck trying to look for the leopard and lions, but I'm sure there's going to be something exciting down here. We often find the monkeys down here and often there's some owls roosting up in the trees during the day. And let's just keep our eyes open. I have found uh, who was it? I think it was Hosanna down on the, when I was on the bushwalk, also down in this same riverbed. It always uh, reminds me of driving in Namibia because we used to drive hundreds of kilometers worth of, of dry riverbeds like this. And the old joke goes, in Namibia, um, what do you do when you fall in a, ribia, uh, in a river in Namibia? You uh, stand up and dust yourself off because they're all like this. So they're ephemeral and uh, they only flow after it's uh, uh, heavy downpours. And uh, yeah, dry riverbeds, lots of sand. And the elephants and animals use that as uh, oasis in the desert. So while we're looking for these cats, it seems James's one has lifted its head off to him, quick. Well, it sort of has lifted its head. Um, it's not exactly we're giving us a full face shot, but he's now licking his left paw, which perhaps has a small thorn in it. You can see he's still got his mohawk, 
And that is the less than attractive stage of male lionhood. It's just before they get to their magnificence. You get this sort of stage, and then the stage before it, which is being exhibited by the young Nkuhuma cub, almost two years old, and he really does have a wispy teenage mane. This is more the mane of a sort of 18-year-old that will eventually go into a full-blooded, uh, well, shall we say, hipster mane, or the mane, for example, the beard that uh, someone like Viam sports, or Tristan, for example, or Eggsy in the final control. All of them are mature males now, and at one stage of their lives, well, they gave the same impression as this fellow. Not quite in their prime yet. <laughs> we also have, of course, Luke in the final control, and he would be described as a maneless lion. He would be described as a Tavo lion. Uh, he will probably never have a mane, a little bit like Brent Leo Smith. It might be why Brent Leo Smith's favourite story is the maneless lions of Tsavo. <laughs> and, well, I now have to concede defeat to Luke, who said he just keeps his mane on his head. And he does have a, a magnificent set of uh, hair on his head, and you will know that I do not. To show Luke, you win. <laughs> No, Minamu, I do not. I believe that this lion is the biggest lion in the coalition, and it is not unusual for a coalition of lions to spend time apart, especially if they are not litter mates. Viam reckons that this cat here is one of the biggest he's seen. I remember when the Birminghams first arrived thinking to myself, these guys are not very big. I maintain that they're not very big, they're not tiny, but when you compare them with the size of that massive Matimba, heavy, uh, what was he called, hairy belly, he was the first dominant male lion that I counted over here. He was a monster. And I think that this fellow is going to be roughly the same size. So it might be that he's just a little bit too much for the other two. I don't think that the coalition is up now. Can you believe it? He's actually up. Vim, do you remember the... I think it was it the 80s or maybe late 90s Afrikaans children's show called Minamu? Yes, with um, Karl Rampkat. With Karl Rampkat, yes. Minamu, Minamu. I just remember the, uh, the tune. Now he's limping, absolutely for sure is he, he's limping. This could be an epic shot. VMP, let me move around. See if we can't get a look at him staring into the sun. A la Lion King. Ah, there we go. This might be worth taking my camera out for. I don't normally take my camera out for lions at all. He seemed to have picked up a fairly large forest under the car. It's all right. Hello, big fella. There we go. That's quite nice. How's that, Liam? Will it do? Just gives him a bit more vantage here. He's definitely limping. I doubt that's from a fight with his coalition mates, and I wonder if it isn't from some sort of conflict with the Birminghams. The one thing those Birminghams have got is a real kind of aggression. Monique, I haven't seen him stand up sufficiently to say whether he's as big as Scarface, the male lion of Ma the Mara. I don't think he's quite as tall yet. I think he'll get there. I don't think his mass is the same. So Scarface is still a pretty heavy lion. Also, Scarface is a little bit like a bird, where you can't really tell their size because he's got so much hair. He's got so much fur on him from his mane. You know, if you were to shave it all away, he would look half the size that he does. In general, I would say that the lions here are exactly the same size as the lions of the Mara, so I don't think that he's uh, any smaller. Uh, Viam's just saying he thought the one notch boy 
which was one of the lions down near the southern end of the Mara Triangle. Liam was just saying he thought he was absolutely enormous as well. How would you compare this chap with Scarface, Liam? Yes. Now we have, I mean, we haven't spent a huge amount of time with Scarface of late, so it's difficult to say. But he's definitely licking that limpy left front paw. And he could easily have caught him a, a claw. Let's try, Antoinette. Let's see what happens. When he turns towards us, we'll look straight into his eyes and let's see what happens. Come on, look here now. Naturally, he's now gone to sleep. Antoinette, no, it's not dangerous to look into a lion's eyes. I have stared long and hard into the soulless eyes of a lion and they do not react. So it's nothing like a dog reacts if you stare into its eyes. Now it's possible it's just not recognizing the eyes because I, you know, I'm sitting in a car, but no. Now I think we should go and ask the same question of Steve who found this cat on foot and see if he would look it in the eye. Yeah, well we clearly survived and we moved out without a scratch. Thank you James. It is marvelous seeing a male lion on a vehicle but to be able to approach one on foot The reason why we've stopped here, in my last discussion was about the knobthorn, about how elephants have damaged it, that one is dead. But what we see all the time out here is, and this is the knobthorn, it's been pushed over, here it is, it's still alive, you can still see the branches, but it's been pushed over and what it has done, it has created an enormous habitat, microclimate all around here, where there are lovely grass species growing. Sort of you take a foot away from the tree and most of the grass species you find are, are these three awn grasses which are all pioneer species. Not a very good grass and this whole open area between this fallen tree and the next fallen tree is basically completely overgrazed and dominated by pioneer species. But where the tree has fallen it is dominated by climax species and two of them being the red grass, Thamida triandra and Panica Maximum, which are two of the most delicious and tasty grasses around, and they are growing in and around because of this fallen tree. So what it allows is for seeds to develop, not just for the birds to feed on, but a seed bank to then recolonize the areas around, and it also makes an enormous amount of habitat for scrub hares, genets, small ground nesting birds, all sorts of seed eating birds. So this one devastating, destructive elephant that broke down this tree has created the habitat for an enormous amount we're not even talking about the insects that could be inside there so we've got to look at it from both sides there's destruction but there's also clarity is it the right word but they are very very instrumental in the creation of so much of what goes on out here in the savannah biome okay let's hear the answers for the tree quiz dun 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 Ellie, no, it was not a red bush willow tree. Red bush willow tree is a simple leaf. This is most certainly not a simple leaf. I've broken off a leaf there from my hat, but this is what we call a compound leaf. This entire thing is the leaf, compound, and it, is, it ends in one leaflet, so we call this an imparipinate, or terminal leaflet. So imparipinately compound. Anyone else got a guess out there? We can keep it going all afternoon if need be. It is a common tree, and I know some of you do know what it is. Paul, here is a knob thorn over here. This is a knob thorn leaf. And this is the other leaf. So very, very different. Very different. 
<laughs> Sienna, it's not a round leaf teak, but the round leaf teak's got a very similar appearance to this one. It has a very similar appearance, but I'm going to grab you one if you want to walk over here with me, Seb. You've got a round leaf teak. They are quite small, they don't get very big. Here is a round leaf teak. Ooh, Linda's, Linda's on the right sort of track, Linda, but you are incorrect by one word. This is the round leaf teak. The closest, well, ladies and gentlemen, it is not a marula. It's not a marula because marulas have got what we call petiole lules over here. That stalk is longer and longer. It's got a little bit of a grayish sort of, sort of antacid sort of feel to it. So what could it be if it's not a marula? Dun, dun, dun. I'm going to leave that with you folks for a little while. And we're going to carry on. And what we see again is two more knob thorns just in the open that are dead. So it's what's happening out here. And it's the fact that we're not seeing the recruitment, but natural process where all the branches are falling down. If I walked through there, I would shred my legs to pieces. So we're going to have to walk around, and that's what animals do as well. So it's a beautiful organic environment over there. Lots of shade, moisture, seeds, snakes, birds. Okay, well, let's go over to Mr. Ralph Kirsten and see if he's managed to find his elephants. Well, I haven't found them just yet, but let's go down. I'm heading now to Chitwa Dam. Uh, there was no results walk, uh, driving through the Mlawati. Uh, here I see reasonably fresh elephant dung, but it's not from right now. Um, so hopefully we'll find something happening. We always know that the hippos are going to be moving around. There's the odd crocodile, and there'll probably be some good birds around as well. So I always like coming down to Chitwa. Um, and if we're lucky, we might uh, see some other animals too, like elephant, possibly even the odd leopard uh, moving around in the area. It's quite funny because even this morning chatting with Herbie, the game scout, um, he's of the opinion, and I agree, that uh, we've probably got quite a few leopards that maybe have uh, made some kills because from us having a lot of activity in terms of us finding uh, their tracks very fresh all over the place it's all of a sudden gone dead so we're of the opinion that they've uh, potentially simultaneously found themselves some food but we could be wrong they could have just moved into different areas as they do no fences here so they can shift around as they please but it's just strange, a lot of activity and then all of a sudden nothing might, uh, he might be right. Uh, take care, um, absolutely. If, if an animal makes a kill, you can, like for instance, if a lion or a leopard makes a kill, you can and leopards uh, coming in for that. Um, you can also have hyena, jackals, all sorts. I just want to have a look at this. Uh, there's a nice little baby waterbuck. So take care. There can be a lot of different animals that will follow. Jackals, hyenas, um, the vultures can come down from the sky, the battlers, even the marabou stork, um, and then other lions and leopards, etc. So lots of animals. As soon as there is blood spilt, you can have animals. You can have animals that uh, will then follow in. Now look at this little youngster, the little waterbuck. Mommy looks quite relaxed. She's watching us, and the baby just lying up in the shade. And they do look like a very cuddly teddy bears. And watch her. She's ruminating. She's probably going to regurgitate shortly. There it comes, and there she chews again. So passing it down into the four chambered stomachs, the rumen, the reticulum, the omasum, and the abomasum, all with different functions, digestion and fermentation and absorption. It's really a, quite an intricate process, has the ruminants in the digestive system. And that little youngster possibly, most likely, be suckling from mum. 
one of the characteristics of a mammal. Look how big its ears are. Very big, being able to hear every little thing around. Denise, I agree with you. It is very cute indeed. It's just a shame that she's lying in the shade for us that we can't see it quite nicely. You see our mom's face is showing up nicely in the sun there. But she's going about her daily chore of ruminating. You know, they do need to spend a bit of time actually gathering all the vegetable matter in their mouth. Um, but then later they also need to spend time actually digesting it. It's one of the disadvantages of being a ruminant. However, you can grab your food and move into a different area uh, away from potential danger and then relax and do your digesting. Whereas the hindgut fermenters, they need to literally almost continuously feed. So beautiful setting here near to Chitwa Dam. We're just a little bit up from the waterhole itself. Paula, I think that baby's probably a month or two old. It's not much more than that. It's still a very young one, as there's a little African monarch flitting about in front of it. Beautiful colors there. Quite noxious as well. Bad tasting. And just gathering some nectar, I suppose, on that little flower. That looks like it might be some wild sage or something. A lot of sawtooth love grass there with all those seeds you can see. Quite dominant here in this particular area. Here's mom showing herself in the sunlight a little bit more. See that toilet seat on her bum? One of the signs that a little baby is going to use to be able to follow mom if there's any potential danger and she has to run off. That's uh, one of those follow me signals. Now, I wonder if we should head on down towards the dam and see. There's quite a few hippos that are shifting around. Okay, so now that I'm moving down towards the water, let's see. Maybe we'll see a lion or a leopard or anything's possible, but we sure are going to see some hippos. And um, I wonder how James is going since he's left that lion. Uh, I wonder if he's found anything else exciting, because that was an excellent one, wasn't it? Yes, we have found a few exciting things. Well, exciting-ish. We've got an impala having a little drinky. Hello, impala. We're going to take a photograph of you. Please continue with your drink. There we are. Do not be afraid. Come on. Don't go away. This is your one moment to shine. You're not in amongst all the others that look exactly like you, which means that you alone can impress in the golden evening light here in the greater Kruger National Park. No, not going to take the chance. Just going to wander off into obscurity like the rest of your friends. Well, that is your choice, I suppose. I feel like there should be some sad soundtrack music now. Anyway, that is not the only exciting thing we have here. We have got a whole lot of wildebeest and nyala across the way there. There they are. Very nice. <laughs> it's a pity I don't have a switch for the open comms anymore. I don't think it works anymore. No, it doesn't. Uh, but we just had a lovely song from Luke in the Final Control who sang the song All By Myself by Celine Dion. He sounded just like Celine Dion, actually. He doesn't look like Celine Dion, though. Thankfully. Let's just go around and have a better look at these Wildenbeestens in this lovely light. Uh, 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 uh. There we go. As vicariously sighing and wheezing for Rusty. Is the aging vehicle I'm driving. Alrighty. Here we have 
Some Wildenbeestens. Should we go with the Wildenbeestens first? Wildenbeest? There we go. I cannot believe that this bunch escaped the attentions of the Nkuhuma Pride the other night. They are sitting here ripe pickings for a lion. Half the youngsters have never even seen a lion, I don't think. Anyway, they have survived intact. And I'm quite grateful. I like these wildebeest. I'm not one who enjoys watching death in the bush. I find it rather disturbing. I'm just going to be quiet for a while and you can listen to the sounds of the wind and the pearl-spotted owl. Wasn't that pretty, everybody? backlit wildebeest and the sounds of crested franklins in the far distance a pearl spotted owl going <whistles> couple of ring necked doves and the old snort from one of the wildebeest who seems to have an allergy I think I'll sit here a little bit longer and see what else is on offer in the calming golden slices of evening sunlight. Yes, well, while Seb gets all artistic with the light coming through that beautiful grass, I believe we have a winner with the tree quiz. Let's hear it, Luke. Cyan, Wazi, and Joe. Well done. You got the false marula. Quite a characteristic sort of leaf structure with the, the, the terminal leaf and the compound leaves. Now, apparently with false marulas, you can take the roots, which are very sort of covered in hair, and you can use them to, to sort of you break them down and you, you inhale them like snuff, and it uses a sedative. You can also smoke them. Bit of a sedative if you want to, if you're having trouble sleeping and on that note the beautiful grass that Sebastian is actually looking at is called herringbone grass and quite easily looked at it looks like one of those cartoon characters of when Garfield eats a fish and it pulls out or one of those things pulls out these bones does it not look like that yeah just me who thinks that so Pogonarthria squirosa is the scientific name and because squirosa looks like a squirrel's tail Looks like a squirrel's tail as well, but a magical plant because this actually grows in disturbed places and what you can do with it is you can take the entire plant and throw it into stagnant pools of water to eliminate the snail and the bilharzia uh, disease that certain snails transport. If you've not heard of bilharzia, it's called schistosoma and it's a disease that we can get. It comes into our blood system and affects our urinary tracts and our kidneys and if you don't take any tablets, it can really be bad. You end up peeing blood and that's not good. But you take tablets and you'll be fine. But you can take these into the stagnant water and you can eliminate it. So I think that's quite marvelous. But um, it is quite common all over Africa. We don't have the cleanest of waters in certain places, but that's a natural thing with the sort of the rural areas in Africa. Elizabeth, we don't plant any trees here. Um, I've got friends down in the Cape who practice, who've got a company called the Precious Tree Company or Precious Pre Tree Project, and they're re-foresting re, uh, the southern, southern Cape, and they get donations, and people come and plant trees with them, and they do it all the time. That's marvelous. They're trying to expand the, the once large forest. It's now very small, trying to make it much bigger. But up here, we don't really plant any trees. We don't get too involved in that kind of management. If anything, I mean, when I talk about the elephants damaging those large trees, we're seeing an increase in tree density because of uh, the lack of, of vegetation. So if we look over here, the grass cover here, there's no way you're going to get a fire 
in here that's going to build up any sort of fuel load that's going to burn trees down. And that's what we're seeing in the savannah these days. There's more carbon in the atmosphere because of industrial pollution, and trees are benefiting. Trees are benefiting from the organic or the carbon in the atmosphere, and that's how they're building. We've been through this before, long ago. All the forests were created because there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, and that took it all in. But trees are carbon sinks. They hold the carbon in. So it's actually very important to plant trees to sequester the carbon from the atmosphere and lower the CO2 levels. But here we don't plant any trees. Uh, Knobthorns and marulas are just two of those very special trees, very characteristic trees to this environment that we are seeing disappear because of management and elephant interactions. And that was a knobthorn that said, don't pass. <laughs> that was a knobthorn, I think it was. Small little knobthorn holding on to my sock this time at least though I'm not bleeding like that was it you last time who was bleeding Seb yeah we were both bleeding because the bush is not Africa they say is not for sissies you're going to bleed out here it's part and parcel of being on a game walk obviously it's not ideal to walk people through a thicket of knob thorn you try and avoid it but every now and again you don't see them I remember back in my days in St. Gita, we used to do vegetation surveys, and the grass was this tall, and you'd come across baby knob thorns about that tall, and it would always catch you on the leg here. And once it catches you on the leg, you've got to go backwards and twist to get it out, and you always bleed. Well, we've got a nice sun setting in the distance then. I'm sure Ralph has got some beautiful light at Chutter Dam. Let's go and see how it looks. Well, look at that, everybody. I've made it down now to the dam, and there's all sorts of action going on with the hippos. A bit of argy-bargy. There's a little bit of porpoising and jumping around. Oh, there we go. Playfully just pushing and shoving each other in the water there. Bit of opening the mouths, trying to show how big their tusks are. And everybody seems quite happy. What a wonderful setting it is. There's the old African data just keenly watching on. Almost like the referee for the hippos wrestling match. He doesn't seem quite, uh, quite interested with them. He's almost a bit like, what are you guys up to? You messing up my fishing grounds and some of them you can see how shallow it is there some of them just coming out half their body so they must be bending their legs where they are just lying flat on their bellies lots of pink ears and there's all sorts going on lots of scratches on their backs as well but that's quite common You spotted Craig. Oh, fish eagle's on the move. Is he going to hunt? We'll be very lucky if we see him hunt. But he's got to spot the fish from quite a way off. There he goes up and gets some height. It's a nice. Saskia, um, yeah, I think the the. Um, Hippos will, will probably move a bit out the way when there's uh, um, elephants that come down swimming. Um, yeah, they're quite a bit bigger than the, the hippos, so they generally, yeah, elephants generally dominate uh, water holes when, if they want to come and be, get boisterous, get playful, and so everything else does shift out of their way. And there's lots of space here at Chitwa Dam, so it's not really a problem, um, and everybody can find their own little spot. I wouldn't worry too much about the hippos or the elephants because there's a lot of water here and it's not a dwindling resource at the moment. It's only when things start getting really tight and there's not much space, there's not much water, and then there can be a bit of conflict between the animals. And that one looks like he's playing around with something in his mouth. See how it's walking? That's actually literally, that's nice to see because that's what they do on the bottom, even when there is, or when it is deeper, They're being very playful, huh? Hey? 
So, welcome to all the viewers. We are down here at Chitwa Dam in the Juma concession of the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. And right next to one of these beautiful lodges in the South African bushveld. What a perfect spot to be sitting and watching hippos very happily playing around in the water and there is all sorts going on down here we've got an african daughter seemingly getting a little bit irritated with the hippos showing it a bit of attention but imagine you could be here sitting on the porch with sipping back on an amarula uh, locally made just down the road in hutzbrate after you've flown in to the hutzbrate airport from johannesburg and uh, you could be sitting watching hippos and who knows maybe elephants and lions and everything else comes down to have a drink uh, steve from canada thanks for commenting that it is amazing or looks as such well i can tell you i'm here and it is wonderful i'm just hoping that we're going to get to hear the african fish eagle who is also present with us at the moment there he is on the uh, on the tree on the opposite side just looking to see if it can catch itself some fish from up high up there it needs to spot something before it makes its approach and that really iconic call of an african fish eagle is really hard to beat there's all sorts happening here at the moment so I, my name is Ralph Kirsten and I'm sitting here on this beautiful waterhole and what a wonderful afternoon it has been. The sun is busy setting, it is lovely and warm, there's not many mosquitoes around and I am just thoroughly enjoying myself. Now there's not only me out uh, this afternoon on Game Drive, I believe Steve is out as well. Let's go and see what he's been able to find. It is an absolutely glorious afternoon and of course a perfect time of the year to be visiting the western fringes of the great Kruger National Park where we find ourselves now in the Sabi Sands on a reserve called Juma. Those are wildebeest, of course, an iconic African animal and this uniquely found in South Africa or in Southern Africa and that of course is the blue wildebeest. My name is James Hendry and you can send through any questions you'd like to during the course of this broadcast of course uh, also of course uh, rory you said what is the temperature well i'm sitting here uh, in my shirt sleeves as we approach um, the winter and it's probably i'm going to guess uh, about 24 degrees celsius or so about 75 degrees fahrenheit and that for winter of course is a standard day out here it's absolutely delicious let's go back to these wildebeest and watch them graze across the golden grasses here and of course if peace is ever something you wish to imbibe from the wilderness well an African sunset is the thing that is going to give it to you the best quite possibly that sun about to set over the Drakensberg mountains to the far west of where we are now one of the most magnificent mountain ranges I think in all the world it stretches more than a thousand kilometers from up north where we are here down into Lesotho and Natal and then down to the Great Eastern Cape Highlands where well magnificent trout fishing a whole lot of skiing sometimes actually as well but one of the most entertaining things you can ever do out here in the wilderness of course is to be on foot And we are indeed on foot, and we've already had a lion on foot this afternoon. It is fantastic being in the African wilderness in Juma in the Sabi Sands, South Africa, Greater Kruger National Park, where the sun sets every day around this time. We found ourselves moving back through a Tambuati grove, beautiful, beautiful trees. Impala are in the distance calling. It is the rutting season. They're making lots of noises. We can't find too many leopards at the moment because they're probably all on a male impala somewhere, busy feeding them. And so hopefully we'll find a leopard sometime soon. And the birds are calling. We've even got a little caterpillar that's busy wafting down into my hand. Look at that. You just have to walk here to find. And being on foot is the only way. 
There he goes. He was doing his little lifeline down from the Tamburiti tree to wherever. I don't know where he was going, but I might try to help him find his way down. Little caterpillar that if he was feeding on the Tamburiti would actually be highly, highly poisonous to eat. So let me put him back on the base of the tree over here, the plethora. So my name is Steve and I'm with Seb on camera and uh, we're going to go from our little sunset here to someone else who's got a much nicer sunset just over there at Chitwa. Well, yes, that sun is definitely starting to dip lower towards the horizon, and uh, I'm sure that these hippos are start uh, going to start to be a little bit more active, heading out of the water sometime soon in order to go and graze as they do in the evenings. And uh, well, there is also a crocodile on the opposite bank. I'm not sure if we'll be able to see him there, far on the other side. There he is, just sunning himself with the blacksmith lap wings and double banded plovers just walking in front of him doing their wading as they do now Raphael from Spain thanks for commenting and I agree with you it is absolutely beautiful look at that lovely reflection of that dead tree as well uh, really making a, a picture perfect moment with that crocodile and the birds and the African fish eagle up above it is a really wonderful spot Dan, yes, indeed, South Africa is a paradise for parks. We've got a multitude of different national parks throughout South Africa. The biggest one being the Kruger National Park, of course, which is a, a, a massive uh, tract of land. And this is where we are situated at the moment. But in all the different biomes throughout the country, we've got beautiful national parks and all well worth a visit. And so please uh, do come out and join us in these beautiful wilderness areas. South Africa is really, uh, it should be on every single person's bucket list. And I can tell you that once you've visited Africa, you will be coming back. And that's it for us for now from a beautiful setting overlooking Chitwa Dam in the Kruger National Park with our beautiful hippos. Well, there we go, everyone. So just for all the normal and usual visitors and viewers, um, we were just doing a South African tourism broadcast there. Um, just a little bit of promotion of our beautiful country that is South Africa and the animals and national parks that we have within, them, within our country. So uh, if you were confused as to why I was uh, reintroducing myself and reintroducing the, the area, well, that's why. So we're still sitting and just enjoying this moment with all these animals here in this p particular spot. So I'm thinking of moving along and trying to still look for our elusive cats. But um, we haven't seen James in a little while. I wonder what he's up to and if he's got any idea where our spotted cats are. No idea where the spotted ones are, and I've just managed to refind the tawny one, hoping he was going to sit up. I thought we were going to use this for our special broadcast that we've just done, anyway, that's why we came back here. We might get him sitting up with the nice light on his face, though, so let's wait here a little while. Hello. How's that, Vim? Any good for you? Yeah, well, let me switch off here. It's time to get up now. The sun is setting. Time for you to go down and have a drink. There's a little water hole not far from here. I can lead you there if you'd like. There's lots to eat there too. A couple of impala. They'll be rutting. They won't be paying attention. There's some nyala there as well. I would leave them alone. They're my favourite. 
couple of wildebeest also possibly get them another year to just increase their numbers. So I think, I think for you, old buddy, old pal, an impala would be a good one for you to eat. Yes? Hmm. Yum. Yes, and there's even one you don't have to kill if you go a little bit further than that. We found him today. Oh, look at you. Hello. Curva, I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to say no, probably not quite as much. You say do leopards sleep as much as lions? Interestingly, as I said on Saturday, I'm not sure if you were watching, I did some research on animals that sleep a lot, and of course the sloth, various species, are universally pilloried for their ability to sleep and their general indolence, uh, but in fact they sleep less than lions do. So I'm not sure there's a, there are many creatures in the world other than those that hibernate that are able to sleep as profoundly as a lion can. I suppose there's a little opportunity to see if we can find some distinguishing marks on his face. Liam, can you see any distinguishing marks on his face? His nose is quite dark, although it does still have the pinkness of youth. He is quite dark maned, but I also think his mane is matted with blood. I think he ate something not too long ago, probably not something very big. Yes, reptilian research, I agree with you. I think that maybe I should just wander up there and have a little snuggle with him. He does look a little morose and depressed. Would you like a hug? I think people also, it's probably time that we did a poll on the names, don't you think? Um, I'm not going to do it right now. We'll obviously need to plan it slightly and decide sort of what category we're going to name them. I think it'd be quite nice to use a category different from the one that we used for the Birmingham boys, which was just basically to canvas the Shangan speakers around here and ask them, and they came up with the four great names for the Birmingham boys. But maybe we need to classify these chaps slightly differently, maybe also in Shangan, but actually give them like a, I don't know, maybe name them after food, like the hyenas of the North Clan in the Mara, or after famous... Uh, legends or people of legend in the Songa culture. That's quite a nice one, actually. <laughs> um, say that again, Luke. Are, there, are the viewers are asking who speaks Swahili or if I speak Swahili? Oh, that's very nice. I believe that you're quizzing, you're quizzing each other as to who speaks Swahili. Oh, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for doing that during the lion sighting. Uh, I hope you come up with somebody who speaks Swahili. David will be back on drive tomorrow if you have any Swahili words to ask. Oh, I see, in order to name the lions correctly. We're not going to use Swahili names down here, though, everybody. I think that we must reserve our Swahili names for the Mara lions, and we can use Shitsonga, or we could use some Zulu names as well, I suppose, if we wanted to, out here. So I think what I'm going to do is canvas around for some Shangan names of legend, kings and chiefs. The trouble is they often have long names, like this chap called Tulila Mahashe, which may basically meant he who quiets the horses. Uh, I'm not sure that Tulila Mahashe would be a particularly good one for one of these lions. Although, no one would forget it. We could name one Shaka. It's just, um, well, oh, yes, I suppose we could name one Shaka. We could name one Soshangane or Manu Kosi, who was the originator of the Shangan people. We could name one, I'm trying to remember my Shangan history, which was never particularly good, but... I used to know some of it. There are lots of, uh, lots of great names that we could use. So I'm going to suggest that's what we do.
Right, I believe Ralph Kirsten has slowly in his nostrils got the smell of happiness's meal. Well, everyone, I haven't left Chitwa uh, concession completely. I've left uh, the Chitwa Dam, um, but I'm still searching in the Chitwa area um, for some of our spotted cats. Let's hope that they may be up and around the airstrip. Maybe Hosanna, Tingana, maybe they've decided to come back down this side. And, uh, well, it's, it's, it's always a nice uh, spot to check uh, just to the south of the airstrip. It's really sort of leopard, for me, country, uh, because it's perfect type amar uh, 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 marula trees. And now I want to say amarula because I was talking about amarula liqueur earlier, uh, which is also very nice. But uh, I'd like to see one of the leopards up one of these marula trees as we're, that we're approaching now. There's a lone wildebeest. It's um, not bad when you get to an area like this that is usually full up with animals and there are not being too many around it at the moment because that can sometimes indicate that there's predator presence. There are a few animals there and then dotted around but there's not as many as there usually are. Craig's just panning there a little bit. Euphemy, a uh, wildebeest normally weighs in, I would say, at probably at about 120 to 150 kilograms. Um, I could be wrong, but it's generally around that, um, and that's what's that, about 320 to about 350 pounds. Um, so they are quite hefty and a lot bigger than you think. A lot of the animals are. I mean, like a female kudu. Is, you can sit at about 80 kilograms. Matthew, I would say a big male um, leopard could definitely bring down uh, a, a blue wildebeest. Um, we used to have cheetah on, on one of the game reserves that um, I was managing in the Eastern Cape. That uh, okay, there was a, it was a three male coalition, but they used to take down. They specialised in black wildebeest which is uh, slightly smaller than the, the blue wildebeest. Um, but yeah, so that just gives you an indication. A, a big male leopard could definitely um, score a, a wildebeest, I would say, but um, they generally aren't in the same kind of habitat because the, the blue wildebeest more so in, in very much grassed areas um, where the leopards are a little bit more in the thickets. So, and it's also quite risky for him to take on a big animal like a, a wildebeest, um, but definitely possible, definitely possible. Like for instance on quarantine where there's all that, that big herd of wildebeest pretty much there every day, I would say that, you know, any of Gajima or quarantine or Hukumuri, um, even Tingana or Sana, they could try with those, with those wildebeest. But uh, there's lots of them, lots of eyes and ears, and so it's probably quite difficult for them. They need to try and lay up in ambush um, or drop out of one of those marulas right onto the top of them. But generally their position is given away long before they even have a chance of, of ambushing a wildebeest, you know, in open areas. It's probably most likely why it's not as common um, or, you know, I haven't really heard much of, of leopard killing wildebeest. It's, probably more so to do with the habitat that they are not in the same type of habitat on a regular basis. Whereas impala, baboons, warthogs, um, even steenbok, they're all in a similar type of habitat. So this is just coming past the Chitwa uh, bush briar area. They obviously have their guests out in this particular spot on a regular basis. I feel like having a briar now. Bry being a barbecue, if you didn't know. The South African word for barbecue. You know that barbecue is actually a French word? If you didn't, it's barbecue. And uh, yeah, you can translate that yourself. <laughs> I know the translation, it's just not that nice, really. Okay, so I'm continuing on the search 
Um, but somebody who isn't searching anymore and has a cat for you is James. Yes, we have our cat, as you can see. He's moved a huge amount since you were last with us. The sun is slowly starting to disappear, which means the coof of the evening is about to arrive, and perhaps that will inspire this indolent fellow to some form of action. Now, we could use those spots on his nose to describe him, which eventually we probably will have to. But really, it is difficult to identify lions from those spots unless they sit very still for a long time. It's not like the spots on lion, um, leopards. Come on, fellow. I think he's actually quite sore, you know. I'd love to know what happened to his leg. They do, you know, David. Sometimes lions do spend their entire lives as nomads, and that often happens in predator-poor uh, predator prey poor areas so you might find males of the uh, of the Namib or males of the Kalahari might spend most of their lives as nomads and never actually set up a, a proper territory because the territory is just simply too big for them to patrol and so essentially they are nomads but in this area it would be highly highly unusual has it ever happened well I don't know would it be likely? Highly unlikely. Because eventually the male's testosterone levels are going to get to the stage that he starts to mark territory and roar and try and sort of set himself up with females and mate, and that's just what his instincts will do. I suppose if a male was completely free of testosterone, if he didn't have sufficient to uh, sort of make him want to roar or mark territory, Remember, it wouldn't be a conscious decision that he made. Uh, well, then I suppose he may spend his life as a nomad. I think also, though, you know, lions are social cats, although this chap is on his own. And I think eventually he would need to seek out company. And so if he wasn't, if our nomad wasn't territorial, there isn't a pride that would tolerate him, and there certainly isn't a coalition of other males that would tolerate him. So I think if he wants friends... And if he wants children, then he cannot be a nomad his whole life. Feels slightly like um, a human lesson there, doesn't it? <laughs> Linda, I wouldn't be. Personally, I wouldn't be against calling them after certain types of avocados. I promise you now, Linda, that if we announce, however that we are going to name the new male coalition of Juma after different kinds of avocados, Twitter will explode. There will be a great avalanche of resentment and anger that we were going to call our dominant male lions of Juma and Safari Live after avocados. We've got some great options. I, I didn't know this. Uh, apparently Pinkerton is a, is a good avocado. Uh, what's the other one? Zucano? That's another uh, good avocado. I would be fully up for it. Oh, Tucano. Tucano? I would be fully up for this, to name them after avocados. Gwen. Gwen is a different kind of avocado as well. So we could have Gwen, Pinkerton and Tucano. I tell you what, let's not try and choose a name this evening, but let's... <laughs> and Guerto. Is Guerto also? I think that we should have a poll tonight. Can we do a poll that says, should we, yes or no, name the avoca males after avocados? <laughs> I mean, those are good names we've given you there. Pinkerton. Guerto. Gwen. <laughs> and, uh, well, I mean, somebody else has had the idea of uh, uh, naming them after Zulu kings, which, of course, it was Viam suggested something similar. Uh, but I think that, uh, given that we're not in Zululand, we should name them after Zulu kings. 
maybe Shungan Kings. But I think let's do a poll on the Avos. I think that'd be quite fun. Because if you all agree that we should name them after avocados, I am fully up for it. Now you can go and find the poll. How do they do that? They go to just, if they, yeah, tell me how to do it. I don't even know. Oh, okay. So you, if you just go to Safari Live on Twitter, you'll see the poll, and you can vote for whether or not you think we should name these male lions after different kinds of avocados. I would do a little Google search of great avocado names. Right across from the pinkening sky, and if you look very carefully there on the horizon, you can see a little bit of the night coming up from the east, which means that the bushwalk is heading home. Yes, we are indeed, and we're just trying to sneak up on some impala, but the eyesight is way too good for us. You can't hear the noises of the rutting impala in the distance, but these poor ladies are trying to figure out, are we danger? Are we trying to catch them while well, they evade the male in the, in the east of them at the moment? The sun is setting in the west. It's a beautiful afternoon. Still really nice temperatures. I have a very strong feeling that James's male lion is likely going to get up and move pretty soon. As there's a fly that is really enjoying landing on my face. We are indeed on our way home. We're not too far from home. But one thing that we do have right over here is quite an easy thing. We've spent a bit of time talking about disturbance. And uh, Herbie running out of shot there. I thought he was going to have a little look. There he is. I know how many of you love to see Herbie on camera. I'm sure we've seen this before. I've shown you this before. But what's characteristic is that there's one here, there's another one, another one, another one. There's a whole lot of them sort of in the middle here. And it's actually quite obvious that this is a wildebeest midden. And the wildebeest male likes to defecate in here. Are you ready for your screenshots there, Chris? I know Chris likes to take screenshots of me with poo. There we go, this is the wildebeest dung, and it's not very not very dry as the dry season comes on. These are going to be more pellets, more separated pellets, but easily confused with waterbuck dung in the, the summer months because of the moisture in the dung. But as it gets dry, as the moisture dries out, like without moving, Seb, I'm just going to grab you this one. This is what, this is what waterbuck dung can look like. But you can see all the individual pellets in there. It's clearly a wildebeest. I mean, if you found this out in the open, it would be quite difficult at this time of year to know the difference. But because it's in in this midden that we're in, this is where the wildebeest male likes to come. He likes to scratch. He likes to urinate and defecate and then roll in all of this. And from this vantage point, it's actually quite nice. He can see. He can see pretty far around. You know, you can see any challenger in any distance. You can see any lion, any predator approaching. And this is kind of one of the little leks or middens that they'll use. And the closer to the middle of the territory of the wildebeest males you get, the more of these sort of spots there are. And because they are sedentary by nature, they tend to stay in one place if they're not migrating. These patches can become quite over, overpowering and you lead to overgrazing and sort of destruction of the vegetation purely because of that nature of rolling and scratching and rolling and scratching. But a, a nutrient hotspot for a period of time, lots of dung, clearly wildebeest male, and uh, a nice spot to just sit and chill and shoot the breeze. He's got the sun setting, the sun rising. Not a bad spot indeed. Hey, Herbie? Yeah, Herbie agrees. So we're going to walk off into the setting sun on our way home before it gets too dark and before that male lion comes to try to find us again. Let's go and see if James has got any movements with his cat. No movement whatsoever, I'm afraid. Oh, there we go. There's some movement. Have we decided yet? Has any, everybody decided whether he should be named after some avocados or not? Ah, I knew it. Ah. We have a... <laughs> so Twitter apparently is very pro. Uh, avocado. 
uh, varietals to name these lines, but YouTube, very anti. Well, I'm amazed that the Twitter audience has accepted that Avo might be a good idea. I'm not surprised, however, that anybody has uh, objected to this. Uh, naming is a very sensitive thing with these cats, one that I find quite amusing. Anyway, uh, well, <laughs> please, whatever that happens, can we not name him after something like a termite mound? I think it is one of the greatest travesties of the Sabi Sands history that one of the most beautiful animals that walks Juma is named Termite Mound. It's almost as bad as the other magnificence that walks the plains of Juma, Chicken Medicine. How you could call two animals of such glorious magnificence, Chicken Medicine and Termite Mound, is absolutely beyond me. I mean, the Birmingham boys have got wonderful names. The warrior, the authority, the tooth. And the tooth isn't quite so magnificent, but it is quite funny. And what's the other one? And suku means um, yellow, doesn't it? The yellow one, the blondie. I mean, those are quite good names. Much better than termite man. Tandi, the one who is loved, the beloved. Klalamba, the mischievous one. Um, who else have we got? We've got Tamba, the rock, Hosana, the little chief, Kuchava, she who is afraid. That's not great. It's, quite, it's almost up there with Shidulu, but nothing is as bad as Shidulu and Hukumuri, the termite mound and the chicken medicine. In fact, Viam's just pipped it. Quarantine, yes. We have a leopard here called Quarantine. I mean, you swear the animal was completely diseased. He's a fantastic animal. He's heir to the throne, eventually, of this area. Possible king one day, Karula's offspring. And his name is Quarantine. One thinks of plague and yellow fever and all sorts of dread disease when one hears his name. His brother got a better one. His brother was Kunyuma. But I believe that Ralph Kirsten, while I get myself into a frothy on naming, has found something more entertaining. Not found anything just yet, Sir James, but uh, we are still looking, 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 looking. We're just coming in here to Twin Dams area uh, because it quite often this time of night when we have the odd leopard or two coming in for a drink. So I thought we'd just come pop in here, just be quiet for a minute or two. And we've got some Natal Spurfowl making a racket behind us, but that's just what they do. They're not alarm calling. Very peaceful, hey? There's hardly a breath of wind. Lovely reflections on the water there. It's like a mill pond. And so that sun has set, and we're in that last little bit of twilight before it gets dark, and the nighttime animals starting to become slowly active. The daytime animals either preparing themselves for a night of worry and anxiousness uh, or bedding themselves up like a warthog would do, be going down into an art fog burrow now and uh, just maybe doing its little last bit of housekeeping before the night's rest. Maybe the hippos have been coming out at Chitwa Dam starting to, but uh, for the time being very quiet here. I think let's start up. Head on, see if we can spot some predators. Vanessa, it is a wonderful picture, isn't it? Beautiful here at Twin Dams. But um, it would be even better if there was a leopard down drinking next to the water, wouldn't it? Right, let's go see what we can find. Not a problem. Actually, appreciate the sightings when you find them, when you've got to work a little bit for them. Strawhead, I absolutely agree with you. That's the perfect time to be fishing, just before sunset, just um, around sunrise as well. The best time 
And if you had to fish in these little dams here, you'll, you could you could um, use art lure, you could use bait, and you could also do a fly. And I'm pretty sure all three of them would work because you've got catfish and um, kerpa or tilapia. So they both are game fish, freshwater game fish. Um, and they'll both take spinners, um, little poppers, they'll they'll go for worms they'll go for you know the little crickets or whatever kind of live baits that you're going to put on and also flies a little woolly bugger or a crazy charlie any, any of those would work so, and i think with these little pans not being fished you could probably pretty much put whatever you like on there and it would origin there's there, there are a lot of fish in these little pans um, they haven't all been eaten, no, and there's lots of terrapins, there's lots of fish, and the only things that do eat them are obviously the kingfishers and then the odd crocodile, so, but they breed pretty well, and in these small pans, sometimes you get hundreds of small fish in there because they don't really have too much space to grow massive, but like Chitwa Dam, that is packed with fish, but, um, you know, it's in a national park. I'm not sure if you're allowed to fish, and uh, that's one of the bonuses. It's just left to to become uh, natural and naturally controlled as well. Maybe some of the landowners, when there's no nobody around, maybe they do have a little bit of a fish just for fun. I'm sure they do catch and release. Um, but other than that, in the national parks, normally, obviously, you're not allowed to fish. But yeah, this is sort of part of the greater Kruger National Park. So there are slightly relaxed rules in certain terms, like potentially on different people's properties. Uh, they would be able, you know, if they wanted to go fishing, they probably could be allowed to. But uh, I think they do conform to, in general, uh, the, the, the general rules of the National Park as well. So I'm sure catch and release would be the order of the day if they do go fishing. Well, catfish, they can be very good eating if cooked in the right way. Um, what little birdie was that? Uh, it looks just like a... Oh, it's a kingfisher. Look, and he hasn't even flown off. Look at that. Wow. Now he has. There he sits. I don't know if you can see him. He's probably just a bit of a silhouette there, Craig. Oh, no. You can see him quite nicely. There he goes. Oh, and he's just swallowed something down. A brown-hooded kingfisher. And we've got some arrow-marked babblers babbling away just off on our left-hand side here, making a hell of a racket. There's some of them all piling up into the tree, quite silhouetted there. Look at that. Oh, arrow-marked babblers. Also cooperative breeders. So that's one big family unit. It's like a gang, a mob. And off they go. You see one goes, they're all going to go now and go and make a racket at the next stop. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like the Aramark babblers. I like all the cooperative breeders, like the helmet sharks, the, um, the Aramark babblers, uh, the green wudu poos, the ox peckers. They're all, you know, it's, it's, it's a very um, socialist type um, grouping. I'm not talking anything governance type things, I'm just talking in, in terms of being in a bush and that uh, grouping type uh, gregarious nature, you're really upping the chances of survival when you're going in a group like that. It's lovely to watch. Alright everyone, so we're heading into that last little few minutes of twilight it's almost if we put the lights on now it's not going to be that bright but going to be dark very soon and so i'm sure that the bushwalk team is heading into the last few minutes of their walk let's head on over to steve he's going on leave soon so i think he'd like to say goodbye we are heading home the light is fading it is starting to get dark the alarm clocks of the evening the Franklins are shouting their chorus. Had some mongooses bedding down for the night. We tried to capture them on camera, but they were just a little bit too fast and maybe a bit too shy. 
for this time of day. It would be lovely if we could get a group of mongooses and habituate them, that we could get right up close and experience them from day to day. There's a, a buffalo thorn that wanted me to wait a little bit. <laughs> lovely. So indeed, I'm headed on away for two weeks. I'll be back on the 24th. So it has been a marvellous cycle. I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. We've had epic sightings of leopards and lions and all things wonderful. Three episodes of Safari Lives. What more can I say? So from my side and from Seb, have a fantastic evening. Enjoy the rest of your drive with James and Ralph. Thanks. Thanks, Coast Rider. I will enjoy it immensely. There's a silent retreat. So I will be... Um, losing myself there and while we do that and while I disappear into the wilderness let's go with James with his lion look at what our lion's doing everybody he's about to go hunting Woohoo! that's why we're waiting here he's going to go hunting now you see he's just uh, doing the pre-ear flick pre-hunting ear flick, perhaps a pre-hunting sigh, <sighs> perhaps he'll even roar Ow! into the night and then go hunting. I'm saying the word hunting as often as I can to inspire him because hunting is what lions should do when they're hungry lions need to go hunting. No. How about roaring? Maybe lions should roar. I think lions should roar Roaring will attract your friends, bring them back here. Roaring will uh, send a signal to the Birmingham boys that this is where you live, this is where you're going to be. Roaring, most of all, will inspire the people who are going to name you, possibly after an avocado, but probably not. Good, okay. Luke says, and I'm not sure why, but at this rate, he's very quickly going to be named Pinkerton. Pinkerton is a great name, everybody. Come on. Surely we agree that Pinkerton would be a fantastic name. In the same way, it is, Mr. Bigglesworth would have been a great name for Tumba, before we called him Tumba. Mr. Bigglesworth he was going to be. What was that, Luke, about Pinkerton? Ah, right, it's held zero threat to it, exactly. And that's what we need to do. We don't want lions to be vilified. We want them to be seen in the same light as Paddington Bear. You know, nobody was ever scared of Paddington Bear or Winnie the Pooh. And so we'd like Mr. Pinkerton the lion to take on the mantle of convincing the world that wild animals are not savages that will tear us limb from limb. Now, there is a lot of debate on this, Stefan, and I am of one school. I know Steve is of, of another. I do not believe that lions hunt into the wind on purpose. I think it happens by chance. There's also a debate as to whether or not they do it to mask their own smell or because they smell something coming on the wind. Now, if I was to ever agree that lions did hunt you know, against the wind, I would do so because I believe that they smelt something in the wind coming towards them, not because they were trying to mask their own scent. And certainly I've heard people say, oh, well, you see, when lions get up in the night, they start to move into the prevailing wind in order to mask their own scent. There are a few reasons I don't buy that. Uh, firstly, I haven't yet to see it be a consistently applied. Secondly, if they always walked against the prevailing wind, uh, it, certainly in Kenya, they'd end up in the northwest corner of the country against the border fence, all of them, uh, and not evenly distributed like they are here and there. Uh, and if these chaps did it, it would be the opposite. They'd end up on the south, where would it be, where the wind comes from the southwest, the southeast normally, and so they would end up on the northwest corner. No, the other way around. They'd end up in the southeast corner. They'd all end up at Skrakusa, the main camp there, wondering what to do next. A 
Oh, Lillian, I think what you need to do is to watch the migration season coming up, uh, hopefully in July and August. Um, if we're very lucky, what will happen is that you will see that lions do not always kill just for food, and sometimes it does seem to be purely for sport. They don't, young lions will absolutely play with half dead prey in the same way that um, uh, Viam's house cat, for example, will play with a half dead mouse. Not so, Viam. Yes, he's nodding and looking quite ashamed, which he should. Uh, so they will do that. And they will, as adults, kill for sport sometimes. Uh, certainly we will see that in the migration season. We watched my most sort of harrowing sighting, I think, or naturally enough in the rain, was with the salt lick pride that killed eight wildebeest. I think it was eight. Maybe six wildebeest in 20 minutes. They didn't eat any of them. And they started off by almost torturing a, a sort of sickly bull to death. He was walking horribly down the road and they jumped on his back. Then they ate off his nether regions and left him writhing in pain on the road. It was a horrific thing to see. And so, yes, whether that you describe that as playing with their food or not, or with their prey or not, I don't know, but certainly they kill for sport uh, if they're not particularly hungry. This guy doesn't do anything for sport. In fact, he doesn't do anything at all. Steve? Oh, he sleeps for sport. He has a good point there, Viem. Viem says he sleeps for sport. He's a champion, champion the sleep sport. And by this time on Saturday, the Yunkuhuma Pride were up on the hunt. We had a magnificent time with them. That's also intended, I've said that so loudly, that he would hear it and be inspired by jealousy to get up and perform. But he is not inspired, so... Let me keep quiet for 15 seconds. I'm not sure why I've picked 15. It might not be exactly 15. Let's see if we can pick up some late autumnal evening sounds. It's quite quiet. You can see there really isn't a huge amount of sound around here. It's almost as if the lion has created a vacuum of bird song around him. I don't think that is the case. I think it's just that the birds are moving into their winter sort of modus operandi, which means that they just don't make quite enough or quite the same sound. One or two robins in the far distance, one or two franklins, and very little insect song. One or two crickets. All right, Lucas, we need to go to infrared. Are you ready, Lucas? Are you ready? On the count of one, oh, no. While we do that, I believe that Ralph Kirsten is already in black and white. Well, everyone, yes, the game, the night uh, game drive has begun. We have switched to infrared night vision, but uh, that doesn't mean that I can see in night vision. Uh, you guys can, so, but it's also just an indication that you understand that there is a slightly different color that you're seeing there on the screen. Um, but, um, and that means that you guys can see everything without having to have the spotlight on it. But I still need to spot it and then we can zoom in on it and we can turn the lights off and the animals can just carry on with their natural behavior. Um, that's the idea anyway. And let's just see if we can spot something. I'm always very careful not to shine on animals that are normally daytime active uh, because the spotlight and the lights can confuse them a little bit and then uh, let's just change their natural behavior. So. That's the reason why we don't particularly stop for day active animals. Paula, I will do my best to look for a chameleon just for you. Thanks for commenting so that that's what you're hoping for. I'm going to look for a chameleon and we've been quite lucky with them of late. Brent's found, I had one, Taylor had one. So I'll keep our eyes out. They generally aren't in the thorny type um, bushes or trees 
Romit, uh, the most intrusive animal at our camp. I'd have to say there's a, there's a couple of them, probably monkeys during the day. They come down and they try to get in the dustbins, um, which we have to put away and make sure that they're away. Um, and they run across the roofs every day, butter, 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 making a lot of noise. Um, so during the day, probably them, but we also have the squirrels and the little mongoose that also, if you leave the kitchen open, they can also sneakily come in. They're not very intrusive. So the monkey is probably the worst during the day. Even the hornbills, they come down and they're in the middle of camp and they're all about, but not intrusive as well. So I'd say the monkeys probably the worst during the day. And then at night, it's probably um, a hyena as well. And um, Yes, Luke just reminding me that uh, we've, we've got a disco ball, uh, you know those mirror balls um, in our sort of courtyard, it's hanging in the tree, I don't know you actually got it up very high in the tree like that, um, and the hornbills, yeah, if you know hornbills, they, um, they're quite silly when, they, when it comes to windows and their reflection, and they will pick at their reflection uh, almost in, to infinitum, so we've got a disco ball there and luckily it's broken up with small mirrors that they, they, they you know it sort of drifts and then they can't see themselves anymore but they do spend quite a bit of time pecking at themselves at the mirror ball as well so but uh, that's as i say not particularly intrusive mostly the monkeys and then at night the hyenas if we leave the dustbin out um the dustbin will get will get dragged um, up to 10 kilometers away from camp so yes um, we need to lock it away inside the kitchen and if it is not locked away inside the kitchen or the door is forgotten open well there is um, chaos in the morning um, and speaking of nighttime predators it seems that James is still with the lion let's hope that it gets up and actually gives you a show Vim's latest comment for this lion, as Luke told us he was going to link across, was, James, this lion is now in REM sleep, which is uh, absolutely correct. He is in REM sleep, which is quite amazing, really. And he's not doing very much at all. In fact, he's not even moving an ear. Thankfully, the movement of the grass indicates that we don't have a technical issue. Hmm. Now, we have a lovely question from some new, aged just nine years old, and you say, what happens after midnight here? Do we hear sounds? Well, some you sometimes I hear sounds in the camp. Sometimes I hear the loud laughter of some of the people I work with, but that's only on very special occasions. Most of the time, actually, it's quite quiet in the camp, but out in the bush, yes, it is quite noisy. You'll hear hyenas going, you'll hear lions going, you might hear leopards going, you'll hear owls going, you might hear frogs in the summertime. Lovely schools of the frogs. There we have a lion up now. Maybe he'll give us a roar. Some you. And in summer, some you, it's very noisy at night. You can hear frogs and insects and some birds calling. In winter, it tends to be a lot more quiet. Now, what we would also be able to tell from the movement of his head is if he can hear a lion calling, he'll turn his head towards that lion. So it would be quite nice to know if he's listening out for his mates. And I wonder if he hasn't heard something to the north there. Ooh, Ralph's got a gummy bear. Oh, 
Okay, everyone. Well, we are just, we've spotted a couple of bush babies here, but they are almost impossible to try and keep still. So very difficult camera work and very difficult to spot as well. I'm just going to wait a second or two for us to see if he shows himself. And then I might just move forward a little bit. But you need to look carefully, everybody. You might just get one quick little view on it. These are lesser bush babies, and they um, they really jump around. They can jump up to five meters. There was one just there now, but they are also quite shy. So when the vehicle starts up, then you sometimes lose them. And I believe now we've probably seen the last of them, unfortunately. You have to be very, very quick. But sometimes you just get lucky that you can just see them a little bit before they disappear. Let me just go down a little bit. I doubt whether we're going to be able to get close, but I will just try. Kathy in Ohio. Well, this is also one of my favorite little nighttime critters. And that is the lesser bush baby, but for us to actually see it now again might be nearly impossible. But let's just try our luck down here a little bit. They've got a very high-pitched little squeal as well. And you often just get lucky that you, you spot their eyes in the dark. Sorry if I'm moving the torch around a lot. I'm just trying to see if I can spot their eyes in the thicket. Maybe there's another one around. I'll just keep scanning. There were two. But I think they have now moved off. And lucky for us. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. Maybe we'll see some more. Maybe we'll get lucky. But it seems James's lion has lifted its head. Well, yes, it has lifted its head, but, I mean, you saw that before you left. He has now yawned and is licking his chops. So, perchance, he's going to have a little roar. Hmm? How about a roar? Yes, tell everybody you're here. Announce your arrival. Be brave and strong and true. Or just sit there and do nothing. Just lick your foot all day long and all night long. <laughs> Ginger, I think that the answer to your question lies in your own heart, really. You know if you can win a fight or if you think you can win a fight and you will engage in that fight if you think you can win it. And I think lions are exactly the same, Ginger. Certainly that was the case when the Matimba boys fled in the face of the Birmingham arrival. Two of them gave way to five Birmingham boys. They did not put up a fight. There was no physical confrontation as far as we're aware. And in fact, they went down and sort of gave up on territorial life and lived in retirement at Londolosi because I think they realized they couldn't win that fight. Now these guys are evenly matched, well relatively evenly matched for two Birmingham boys. If all four of them were to return here, they'd put these evokers to flight. The Birminghams are not afraid of a physical confrontation because they know that as a coalition of four, it'd be very difficult for anyone to beat them. And so I think absolutely most animals out here will judge whether they can win a fight or not and then make a sort of call as to whether to run or engage. In fact, possibly even more so than human beings. Now, Minamu, you can see exactly now why or the advantage of that white under the lion's eye. It is said to be there to reflect light into the eye at night and I think that's a very good reason for having it. You can see it's right there under his eye and reflecting light 
directly into it, so I think it just helps him to see a little bit at night. Under the nose, there's no real white that I can see. Certainly, Nyala have got white lipstick, but the, the lions don't. Cheetah, of course, have the opposite, and we think that's to stop reflecting light in the day. I'm... You know, what that's true, I don't know. Cheetah will hunt at night in the absence of night in the absence of other nocturnal predators. Lions and leopards, or leopards certainly will hunt, and they've also got that white underneath their eyes. They will hunt in the day in the absence of other competition. In fact, most of the time, leopards will happily hunt in the day. I'm not sure. There's a moth flying by, you saw that. It's, its eye shining in the infrared. Isn't that cool? Let's see if we can get a decent shot. <laughs> That's very cool. I think it's a moth. Anyway, he's a very accurate hoverer, is that insect. Yeah, this chap's foot is very sore. All right, everyone, that's going to be it from this line. We're going to head home and to the glorious cooking of happiness. I'm sure Ralph Kirsten, oh, look at that, is going to do the same. Well, everyone, look at that. You can see now, this is not the spotlight. I hey? remember it's infrared and that little baby having a nice old drink from mom. And well, as we watch these wildebeers just moving up towards quarantine, shame they need to keep their eyes and ears open during the night. And um, well, let's hope they survive the night. Uh, it's a tough one for them, but they seem quite happy, all relaxed, grazing along. That's why they like the open area of quarantine, I believe. Anyway, it's been quite a frustrating day for me. Uh, I've been really looking for cats, but um, haven't had much luck. But that's the way of the wild. We can't uh, put these things in cages, and they're not standing on ceremony. So I'll just have to keep trying hard, and that's it. So that's it for me as well. I'll say good night, and, well, we'll see you all tomorrow. But off to James for now. Yes, so actually I, we are not finished with you just yet. Now I'm talking like this because I don't want to move my mouth because it will shake the camera. That is Jupiter and you can see its moons. Is that not amazing? There's the three moons of Jupiter. Jupiter's got, I think, at last count over 50 moons. It may even be more than that now. I'm not sure what that thing down towards the far right hand side is. I think that's just a star. But Jupiter's moons are in glorious display this evening. That they are so bright you can almost see them with the naked eye. Not quite. That is very cool. The lion is fascinated by astronomy there. You can see he's staring at the heavens in absolute wonderment. you stop licking your foot? It's all you've done all day. Other than sleep. A moth is still flying around. Pearl spotted owl calling. Two of them. Right, well, we're nearly done, everybody. Uh, fear not, we are not yet decided on how we are going to decide what to call these lions, so I don't want anybody to spend the rest of their days or evenings worried that we are going to call them after avocados, if that isn't what you want, or after something else that you don't really want. Uh, bear in mind, of course, that you will inevitably be slightly disappointed uh, by the names that are eventually chosen because, well, it is not possible to please everyone. Such is the way of life out here, of course, but I do think that we should get on to the process of naming these magnificent Avoca boys. Let us have one last look at the uh, moon, not the lion, not the moon, the Jupiter and its moons. Paulie, you say I mustn't scold him. 
Well, Paula, my father always scolds Fenton the dog when he licks his paws. I feel it's only fair that I should do the same to this lion. A lot of you have spent a lot of your time watching him, waiting for him to get up and be magnificent, which he, he is. It's an absolutely astounding picture of the largest planet in our solar system. All right, everybody, that is going to be it from us this evening. I thank you profoundly for joining us and in putting up with our sort of slow cat, but we had some great chat, some wonderful talks, and, of course, Ralph and uh, Steve did their bit, as did Herbert. So until tomorrow, stay safe and happy wherever you are. We'll see you at 6.30 in the morning. Bye-bye. <laughs>